two weeks ago, I, um, I traveled to Belgium because someone wanted to talk to me about art and engagement. And it was an, an art student, about 21, and he had emailed me saying that he had trouble staying hopeful and that with everything he did, he felt like a druppel op a gloeiende plaat, which can be translated as feeling like a drop in the ocean. It's a classic feeling, I'm sure you've all had it, where you act on something in your own small manner and then you find the scale of the problem crushing you, discouraging you. So you're, you're, you're sorting out your garbage and then you see a documentary of the plastic soup in the sea and then you stop acting because you think, well, I cannot save everything. So you end up saving nothing. And his email annoyed me. And I, and I didn't really understand why. Why the fact that he wrote to me that he felt like a druppel op een gloeiende plaat, feeling like a drop in the ocean, annoyed me so much. And when I started thinking about this, I realized that feeling like a drop in the ocean is mainly ego, but dressed as something noble. It's ego dressed in so-called experience. It's ego dressed in wisdom. And when I started thinking about this more, I realized that, that feeling like a drop in the ocean is more than anything proof of a very undeveloped sense of the self. It's, it's the disappointment that the world doesn't have you at its center. And don't get me wrong, we all have it, uh, this, this undeveloped sense of the self. And the fact that we have it is not entirely our fault because we are constantly being seduced into fueling that sense of the self. You can make a lot of money out of this feeling. But when I, when I dug deeper into the mechanisms of this feeling, I realized that feeling like a drop in the ocean basically just demands proof of your efforts. This feeling won't shut up until you can prove to it you matter. This feeling wants foundations with your name on it. It wants reports with proof saying with numbers how much your impact is on the world. I think it's the reason why rich people don't pay tax but do have big foundations with their name on it. So they can feel like the ocean instead of the drop. Um, and when you find yourself feeling like a drop in the ocean today or throughout your life, this feeling will probably urge you to undertake a quest to find proof of your efforts. And if you decide to embark on such a journey, you should be warned because in search of proof of your efforts, you can end up destroying your efforts. And sadly enough, you can end up destroying other people's efforts as well. We all probably know this feeling in, in, in the personal sphere where you want someone to prove to you they love you and by wanting that, destroying the love they have for you. But also in the greater scheme of things, two weeks ago, the South African poet Antje Kroch stated in a Dutch newspaper that um, during the Truth and Reconciliation Trials, she was also a journalist there, there were a lot of the, uh, Western journalists sitting in the back of these rooms asking a lot of questions, in, inquisitive questions, critical questions, questioning the whole idea of restorative justice, restorative justice, justice based on forgiveness instead of justice based on punishment, what we have here in the West. And by questioning this idea of restorative justice, they were thinking that they were the crown witnesses of history, but thereby forgetting that by questioning this, they were complicit to what happened there. They were forgetting that holding something to the light so thoroughly, what you hold to the light changes color. Antje Kroch stated in the newspaper that in the end, the West never had any faith in, in the idea of restorative justice. And therefore the West wanted proof. And by wanting proof of this, they did irreparable damage to these trials, so she stated. And I was going to tell this art student 
about this article of Antje Kroch. And I was going to tell this art student that I myself went to the United States to investigate forgiveness. I went to Charleston where a brutal shooting happened. A, a, a white boy walked into the church, a black church, and shot nine people there. And after that, three weeks after that, the families forgave the white boy who did it. And I went there to investigate forgiveness. And after this forgiveness, the families got a lot of attention, both praising and accusatory, saying that after three weeks, forgiveness is cheap. You cannot forgive after three weeks. And by this attention, by asking so many inquisitive questions, the families were torn apart. They were distrustive towards each other's forgiveness. And I, I wasn't necessarily distrusting there, but I had so many questions I ended up destroying their efforts, their efforts to create something so vulnerable like forgiveness in such an unforgiving world. And I was planning to tell this art student all this, that whenever his ego demands proof of his efforts, that he has to sit down with his ego and say to it that he doesn't want to risk it. And I was quite happy with my analysis. The only problem was the art student never showed up. Uh, so I'm glad you were all here today, that you showed up. As I was waiting for him, I thought, well, at least show up before you get disappointed, right? Uh, and I thought, well, I'm not even sure if you're entitled to disappointment if you're not showing up. And then I got mad, then I thought, well, stop bothering the world with your cheap disappointment if you're not showing up. And the other thing is, because he didn't show up, I got disappointed by someone who is at least 10 years younger than I am. And I didn't think I was old enough to be disappointed by people who are younger than me. <laughs> so when I was preparing this, slightly discouraged, I wondered if when he decided not to show up, he was thinking about himself or about me. Because the strange thing is, I showed up today anticipating that you were showing up. I wouldn't be here if you weren't here. And as I was anticipating your presence, I had to get my act together, get out of bed, brush my teeth, put on something nice. And I did that because I was expecting to see you here. So maybe showing up is something you don't do for yourself. And maybe it's not even you do for someone else, but for each other. You show up so there is an each other. So that there can be space between us, which keeps our head from hanging down. So maybe you and I are the drops, and I, I think we should be honored to be a drop. I think we should wear that responsibility with grace and dignity. But the ocean is between us. So if you ask yourself today or for the rest of your life, why did I show up? Well, so that we all keep brushing our teeth and so that oceans become a possibility. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I, um, I would like to extend, in my own name and my co-chairs, um, a very warm welcome to everyone here um, for this Europe on Trial. It's a project that has been put together, thought about, by Yunis Osmanur and Lara Stahl. And like we heard before, I think it's also a very good moment to actually thank all of you for showing up. And I think we got an idea on how important that might be. 
This very powerful prologue was brought to us by Rebecca De Witt. She's a writer and a theater maker. And having said that though, I think it's very important to underscore that this might look like a stage and it might look like theater, but it isn't, right? We're trying to address something um, that really talks about high stakes in our society today. And everybody that you will hear will speak in their own uh, name, in their own, as their own person, so a personal perspective. So we're not performing and we invite you to participate with us. Um, it might look like a performance, but it's really about uh, addressing the real issues uh, and the real challenges. So my name is Olivia Ruta Zibwa. I'm a senior lecturer at the University of Portsmouth, where I teach international development uh, and I do research on international uh, relations. And I used to be in a former life, uh, a journalist for More Magazine, uh, working as an Africa editor. Next to me uh, sits Maxim uh, Feschman. He's a judge at court mid-Netherlands and also a former asylum lawyer, but he's here in personal capacity. On my other side is Mariana Yati, and um, she's a legal scholar and a lecturer at the uh, Leiden University, specializing in European immigration and asylum law. Over to me. Over to Thank you. you. <laughs> Uh, just quickly explain what, what my role will be today, because we've divided roles. Uh, uh, I will have a more practical part leading you through this three-hour session, which is quite a long session, but we have a lot of speakers who will uh, speak their mind, give their opinions, and we'll uh, guide everyone through that. Um, so we'll introduce the speakers and do the timekeeping, and I'm very strict at that, so let me promise you. Um, the idea is that there will be a number of speakers uh, who already have someone as a respondent preparing to reply to what they will have said. Uh, so the idea will be there will be a speaker, there will be a respondent, uh, and then there may be questions from the panel, from us, and also questions from the audience. Each one of us will take the role of, of uh, guiding each of the speakers through this process and, uh, and, uh, and, and give the floor for questions. Um, some will be only statements, so there will be no follow-up questions. We'll make clear <coughs> what that is and when that is. Uh, and of course, if there's time left, there will be more questions. And at the end, there will be a special session for um, uh, general questions from the audience. Um, my specific role at the very end will be to sum up what uh, I've heard today, uh, try to uh, make a not draw conclusions, but just the few things that stand out, which then will uh, follow, be followed up by a number of questions that will be put, put back to you. Uh, the theme is uh, Europe on trial today. We will have, we'll have tried to formulate five questions that, that will reflect that. The discussion we'll have here, and it will be you who will answer those questions. More details will follow later on that. Uh, Lara Stahl, who is there, will finish with a few uh, thoughts and remarks of her own about uh, following the verdict, as we call it, or whatever it will be that we will end up with. Um, uh, there will be no break, so uh, it's quite a long session. If you need to use the, the washroom or the bathroom, uh, feel free to do so silently uh, just outside the door on the right-hand side. Um, that's for me for now. Thank you. Over to Mariana. Thank you. I would like to welcome all of you on my behalf as well. <coughs> Today, uh, we investigate the responsibility of Europe for breaching its obligations towards people attempting to seek say, haven in its territory. <coughs> we hold this tribunal here in the former court of Amsterdam, amongst ourselves, the citizens of Europe, because we believe that it is our responsibility no official court or government is present. The prosecutor that my uh, colleague Maxime will introduce in a moment, uh, Yonis Osmanour, is one of the initiators of the project. There is no lawyer that will defend Europe. The speakers will all temporarily step into the shoes of expert witnesses, defense lawyer or prosecutor. But the most important role is reserved for you, the audience, the jury, but also the accused 
as citizens of Europe. Having the double role of being a member of the jury and the accused means that at the end you will need to make a judgment about yourself. You will hear a summary of the different contributions that my colleague Maxime will prepare at the end and several questions will be presented to you where you will have to decide on the guilt or innocence of Europe. And when we say Europe, we mean Europe as EU, as the governments of Europe, but also as the citizens of Europe. This trial will end with a couple of questions, uh, as we said, that you will have to decide upon. Um, this session will not so much focus on technical questions about international agreements, st statistics or laws. This trial will rather emphasize the moral and ethical questions we are facing. At the same time, we're not neglecting, we're not disregarding the facts. Of course, laws are there as guidelines and we should acknowledge that. But at the end, the questions that we're discussing today are primarily political. And before we let our politicians speak for us, we need to develop our answers for ourselves. And of course, this court doesn't have any legal binding um, power, but we could ask ourselves whether this makes it any less important. This trial is rooted on the idea of dependence, intersectionality, and connectivity, instead of fragmentation and isolation. The issues we are facing today are every bit related to political, economic, neo-colonial, and ecological reality we're facing. In our line of work, me and my co-chairs are used to looking mainly at the responsibility of the European Union, of states, and that is the legal responsibility in particular. Now, we are here to discuss the moral responsibility as well, and not just of the EU, but of our governments, and also the responsibility of each one of us as a citizen of Europe. So today, we put our responsibility as well to your judgment. Thank you. So, um, this is the moment to introduce the first speaker, um, Yonis Osman Nur. He's, like I mentioned before, one of the hosts of this event. Um, he's a Somalian human rights activist and an artist. And correct me if I'm uh, wrong, but arrived uh, 13 years ago in the Netherlands. And it took a very long time to have the proper legal status um, until last year. So um, Yunis, I invite you to take the stand to formulate the accusation that you have prepared. Thank you. Thank you. I'm here to speak not only on my behalf, but on the behalf of all the refugees that are currently living in Europe and around the world. From Rome to Amsterdam, from Greece to Libya, from the Rohingyas to the Palestines. I speak in the name of those who had the courage to board a boat, for those speaking, for those sleeping under bridges and in train stations, for those stuck at Lesbos or Lampedusa, for those for whom the Mediterranean became a grave, for those hiding under trucks, and for those imprisoned in detention centers all over Europe. I speak for those who did not commit any crime. Their only crime is to exist. Today I'm standing in front of you to accuse Europe of violations to human rights with regards to its asylum policies. I became an unintentional witness of the EU's criminal acts. As long as there is no official institution recognized by the West 
and ready to look itself in the eye for its imperialist behavior and exclusionary policies, we will have to create our own platforms in absence of an alternative. We'll use the space of art to reach justice. I find myself constantly trapped in these absurd inconsistencies. We seem to live in a world where goods are free to travel, but some people are not. Weapons can be easily distributed, but we do not seem to consider it a crime. Money is invested in walls and fences instead of in creating conditions for newcomers to have access to schooling and work in order to be able to contribute to their new country. We are part of a continent that owes much of its richness to the colonization of other people and resources, but does everything in its power to desperately forget that. Today, the Western countries are the biggest polluters, but the South deals with the consequences. The connection between identity and territory is on the rise again. It's as if we forget that people have always been migrating and exchanging. We are trapped in a narrative of the West against the East, as if Islam has not always been part of Europe. Ramadan Karim, by the way. But what do we actually mean when we speak about Europe? Who is the EU? Are we talking about citizens, politicians, the European Parliament? Who is this desirable continent and what, does, and what constitutes it? Now let's look at some facts. Europe covers 2% of, uh, of the Earth's surface. The total po population is about 11% of the world population. Between the 16th and the 20th century, European powers controlled at various times the Americas, almost all of Africa, Oceania, and the majority of Asia. In 1955, the Council of Europe was formed in Strasbourg following a speech by Sir Winston Churchill concerning the unifying of Europe. The Maastricht Treaty established the European Union in 1993 and introduced European citizenship. In 2012, the EU was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. The European anthem that is both used by the Council of Europe and the EU is called Ode to Joy. And the text of the anthem goes as following. United, Europe, uni Europe is united, united it may remain, our, uni our unity is diversity, may contribute to world peace. May there forever reign in Europe, faith and justice and freedom for its people in a bigger motherland. Citizens, Europe shall flourish a, and flourish a great task. Calls on you, golden stars in the sky, the symbol that shall unite us. Europe has a website. It's called europe.eu. 
and it describes some of its goals as following. Promote peace, it, its values and the well-being of its citizens, offer freedom, security and justice without internal borders, <coughs> combat social exclusion and discrimination, promote scientific and technology progress, enhance economic, social and territorial cohesion and solidarity among member, member countries, respect its rich cultural and linguistic diversity. A year ago, I was suddenly granted asylum. After 12 years, of being in the Netherlands. During the last five years of my so-called illegal existence, I was part of We Are Here, a movement of refugees in limbo that ask for the acknowledgement of their existence. We are here started with just few individuals, never planning to start a movement. In September 2012, two individuals were put on the streets. And so they went to the protest diaconi in Amsterdam asking for help. But the diaconi couldn't give them a place to sleep. The two individuals decided to stay the night in the garden. The next day came Dr. Ko, present here today, there. And he put up a canvas in the garden to protect them from the rain, and soon more people started to gather beneath that improvised tent. All of them in the same situation. All were rejected refugee status in the Netherlands. They were put on the street with a, with a message to return to their home country. But they couldn't simply return. Some of them didn't have identity papers. Some of them were too afraid and traumatized to return. Some of them couldn't as they come from countries that do not recognize them as their citizens. The group grew quickly because it appeared that many people in the Netherlands had ended up in this limbo situation. And we, together, hand in hand, made this problem visible. <coughs> so I hereby accuse the Netherlands on a larger level, on a larger level, the EU of not acknowledging the problem that many refugees aren't given a status, but cannot go back to their country of origin. Within the European Union, EU members can travel freely, but some refugees cannot. The Dublin Convention forces people to apply for asylum within the first country of arrival, this has created a situation in which the more vulnerable members of the EU, namely Italy and Greece, have received the largest amount of people, but they have little infrastructure in place to be able to deal with this. I accuse the EU of not operating as a union, and instead saddling its most economically fragile members with an enormous responsibility that was doomed to fail. I accuse the EU of lacking a collective asylum policy, of being unable to agree upon 
quota or finding it easier to make deal with Turkey or with the Libyan border control than to take responsibility as a union and develop clear agreements together. I accuse the European Union of holding people captive without any infrastructure in Greece since the Turkey deal has been activated without providing any news about their status. I accuse the European Union of paying African countries to keep people inside their borders and in doing so, making the country, making the journey to Europe even more dangerous. I accuse the European Union of sending people back to places they've so desperately tried to flee. For all the people that denied, that died during their attempt to cross the sea. For putting fishermen on trial for saving people's lives. For seeing people as numbers. For being obsessed by statistics instead of ethics. No one wants to leave home. Nobody desires to be displaced. And nobody chooses to be a refugee. Dear audience, members of the jury, accused, Europe is guilty. You are guilty. We are guilty. The anthem of the EU sings of how our unity in diversity will contribute to the world peace. It sings about the great task that call on us, citizens of Europe. But instead of celebrating diversity, we are making differences between native citizens and migrants, running the risk of creating secondary citizenship. Instead of contributing to world peace, we close our eyes to the consequences of stopping people from crossing the border. Despite its anthem, Fortress Europe developed an ugly face. Being found guilty might also be a chance, an opportunity. It creates the possibility to take responsibility. I propose to start today. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Yunis. I invite to the stand Sangeeta Jagai. Um, you have about seven minutes for your presentation, and I think there's also a PowerPoint presentation. You will see a sign when two minutes are approaching and one minute, yeah. and you will hear me. Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon, members of the jury. I'd like to, sorry, the PowerPoint doesn't seem to be working. Can anyone help me? I think I Is it working for you? No. Yeah, it's coming. Thank All right, you. thank you. I'd like to ask you to join me on a trip down the memory lane. What was it like to be in primary school? Do you remember who your very best friends were? Mine were Sanjay and Robert. And do you remember all the fun things you would do with them? I remember after school, we'd run to our bikes and just bike, bike, bike everywhere we could to come home hours later with very worried parents. Do you remember your very first holiday? Was it with family, with friends? Were you traveling abroad by plane? Were you excited or a bit nervous? The reasons why I'm asking these things is because a lot of the things that we've done in our childhood has shaped us to who we are today. 
And a lot of the things that we've done when we were younger has been facilitated because we are nationals, because we have a nationality. Because we have a nationality, we were able to travel the world and to visit new places. And because we have a nationality, we were able to enjoy our right to education at primary school, but also later at high school and university. And this is exactly what the stateless don't have, simply because they're not recognized by any uh, country as a national. Also, this is also the case for, for Danny and Angela in the picture. This picture was taken five years ago. They're born and raised in the Netherlands in a temporary uh, residence facility for people who have been not, who've been denied their asylum claim and are awaiting their process to be deported or to be repatriated, as they say. But the, the, the problem with Danny and Angela is that they're now eight and five years old and they're still stuck in that facility center. And that's because they have no country to go back to. Danny told me, Sangeeta, I don't have friends because every time I meet children my age, they're gone in the next few weeks, they're gone in the next few months. He said, I cannot uh, go anywhere with Angela and my mother because we need to every day tell to this man downstairs that we are still here. And that's where him trying to explain that there is an obligation for him and for his family to report that they're still there because they're undesired and because they're irregular uh, uh, residents. And the reason why they're stateless is through no fault of their own. It's because their mother was born in China and she was not registered at birth because of the one-child policy and her parents having to select only one child to be registered. She was trafficked at the age of 15, ended up in the Netherlands being subject to forced prostitution, ended up with two children that she tried to register in China. But they said, because you've never been registered, we cannot register your children as nationals either. And imagine all the good memories of your childhood. These, these children are deprived of every single thing that helps them to grow to their, full, to their fullest potential. The Netherlands says, yes, we have a law where stateless children born in a territory can, be, acquire, can acquire citizenship. But the law says you have to prove that you're stateless. And in order to prove that, you need to have documents. And the one thing that stateless people don't have is documents. Also, the Netherlands says, yeah, in order to get a nationality, you need to have three years of lawful residence. But the, these children, just like many others, have never had lawful residence since they were born, and they can't seem to get it. But Denley and Angela are not the only ones. In Europe, there's 600,000 people that are in the same situation, that are stateless. And worldwide, worldwide, there are 15 million. And to make it even worse, every 10 minutes, a child is born stateless somewhere in the world. And this may now seem like a huge issue, but our European Commissioner of Human Rights said that in Europe, statelessness is resolvable. We can fix this problem as states, but also as citizens in accepting these people as one of our own. And in order to understand how we can do this, we need to understand the problems. How is statelessness caused in Europe? I'm going to go through one of, like a few of the main causes. And one of the main causes is the dissolution of the USSR. At the time, there were a lot of ethnic groups who had a nomadic lifestyle, like the Roma, who never registered themselves or their children. And at the time of the dissolution and when new states were established, these new states said, yeah, you can acquire our new citizenship if you can prove that you're a former Soviet Union citizen. And they were not, so they were left stateless. And we still see that people are a victim of statelessness and because of this. There's also different causes in the refugee context. Think about the Syria refugee crisis. Statelessness is often overlooked. But if you imagine that the nationality laws of Syria are gender discriminatory, it basically means that only fathers can transmit their nationality onto their children. 
This no, taking this into consider, consideration when one in every four refugee households is led by a woman is actually a problem and a risk of statelessness. Because when a, mom, when a, when a woman is pregnant and she travels alone abroad, and gives birth to the child abroad, she has to prove that the father is Syrian. If that doesn't happen, the child doesn't get Syrian nationality. And we've seen also in the case of Danny and Angela, a host state is not always as welcoming to, get, uh, to grant citizenship. So here we see that forced displacement is a cause of statelessness, but it can also be the other way around. Statelessness can also be a cause of forced displacement, like we see in the Rohingya. They've been made stateless back in Myanmar because of, of a wider targeted discrimination, and they're now seeking refuge elsewhere. And it's up to us to welcome them and grant them citizenship. So I'm saying this because the right to a nationality is a fundamental human right. It's enshrined in all core human rights treaties that the European countries have ratified. And because it's a human rights issue, it, it, it is a human rights issue that also results into other human rights problems. Because we don't have a nationality, we cannot vote, we cannot go to school, we're a victim or we're more um, vulnerable to social exclusion and to, to uh, human trafficking. And the main issues in, in Europe is not that we haven't ratified the, the international treaties. We actually have. We've ratified the most niche conventions that focus on how to protect the stateless, that focus on how to prevent statelessness and reduce statelessness. Our problem is that we fail at doing the first step of identifying these people. There's in a lot of countries no procedure to identify that a person is actually stateless and therefore they're not entitled to enjoy the rights that they're actually entitled to according to international law. Also, the European states are actually producing statelessness as well by not granting the nationality to children who are born on the territory. So we're also unsuccessful at preventing and resolving statelessness. Therefore, I, you know, and maybe one more thing, the reason why I'm specifically focusing on statelessness in, instead of the whole broader undocumented issue is because there's such a clear set of international rules. They may be stateless, but they're not rightless. And therefore, Europe should be held, uh, you know, I think Europe is righteously held on trial to see to what extent they're violating their right or their, their obligation to protect the stateless, but also to what extent they're not preventing and reducing statelessness according to international law. Thank you. Thank you very much. Don't leave us yes, just yet. I thought uh, I was done, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I did not. So this was Sangeeta. Uh, she's a doctoral researcher at Tilburg University, focusing and specializing in statelessness. We have Matthias Klaas, who has prepared a question or a response uh, for her. Is there a microphone for him? Thank you very much. Is it on? Yes. Yeah. Well, thank you for your... Uh speech. Um, uh, there's so one cause of uh, uh, statelessness that you didn't mention. Um, migrants who travel to the EU are uh, eligible to be sent back to their country of origin, uh, for example, when it's considered to be safe. But to, uh, when a migrant uh, cannot be identified, this eviction cannot take place. Uh, and instead, it takes uh, immigration officers a lot of time and effort to establish their identity and their country of origin. Um, increasing uh, the overall chances for the migrant to stay, because the longer they stay, the longer their chances, uh, the, the bigger chances that they uh, can stay permanent. And exactly because of this reason, people smugglers uh, stress their customers to throw away their passports. And the current refugee system uh, therefore already incentivizes people not to have identity documents. Um, you propose to take special care of status people, as noble as that may be. For a migrant, it could therefore be uh, extra interesting to pose as a stateless person. Um, additional rights or special care for stateless persons could thus uh, increase the number of migrants coming here, becoming an extra pull factor, and become an additional incentive for people to destroy their identification papers. How would you propose to minimize these effects of your plea? 
Thank you, Mathes. Um, so the question raised there is basically, given that there, is, uh, there are many rights attached to statelessness, I think the, the point put forward was uh, the idea that maybe some uh, people on the move then have an incentive to get rid of their documents. If I may, I would like to uh, add also a question. Listening to um, your presentation, I was thinking, um, how would you answer the, rather than maybe just the, the very practical short-term way that we should address statelessness, if we look at the moral imperative that we have here to try and think about the moral obligations, does statelessness invite us to think, to rethink the fact that we have states with borders and nationality and citizenship? Is that not an invitation to maybe focus the problem there rather than trying to make sure that everybody has their papers? So my question basically is, if we think of migrants, they do not necessarily die because they don't have money to come somewhere, but a lot of it is linked to the fact that there are rules and regulations that keep people in or out. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll start with answering the question uh, uh, that Martijn posed. Thank you for that question. Uh, sorry, <laughs> Matthijs. <laughs> Bad with names, but um, it's a very valid question that you're posing because a lot of states have this fear that if they are going to introduce a statelessness determination procedure that also has uh, a residence permit linked to it and rights linked to it, um, that it would be an incentive for migrants to behave in a way it, so that they can actually acquire, uh, uh, state, to be recognized as stateless and enjoy their rights. Um, I want to stress that from what we've seen so far, those states that actually have uh, introduced such a determination procedure, we've seen that it didn't have that incentive factor or this, this, this factor that stateless door that all migrants hop on board and jump to apply for a stateless determination procedure. In the UK, for instance, such a measure was introduced in 2013, and so far only 46 people have been granted statelessness status. Also, the thing with being stateless is that you don't have a nationality and you cannot fake not having a nationality, because it's not in our own right to determine whether we, want, we are going to be a national or not. It's up to the full autonomous power of the state to determine this. And the status determination procedure would actually help us in clarifying whether someone is a citizen or not. Because right now, what we're asking the people is to prove through documents that they're stateless. Those who have destroyed their documents or lost their documents, well, don't have proof. But that also means that, you know, they're not necessarily labeled as stateless. But at the same time, if there were a stateless determination procedure, the state would actually collaborate with the person, share the burden of proof in that sense, contact other states to see, hey, you know, I have a person here, he is not documented. Is he still registered in your system as a national? That fixes the problem. And that's also why it doesn't have that incent, like that pull factor. Also, um, your Honor, I'd like to answer your question right now. Um, it is true, we're living in a system where, which is created by nation states, nation states determining you know, what the borders are, who belongs to you as a, as a national and who doesn't on the basis of behavior and what states would like to see their citizens to be. And because we determine, because states determine who belongs to them, we automatically exclude them as well. And that's indeed, the issue of statelessness. But we have to, at this stage, row with, you know, we have to deal with the system that is there right now. And the only way to resolve statelessness is to actually provide safeguards for those who are otherwise stateless by changing the nationality law. By saying, for instance, you know, not only fathers can transfer their nationality, but also mothers. Simple adding one word in a nationality law, for instance. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We will move on to uh, the next speaker. Paul Scheffer, I invite you uh, to take the stand. Paul Scheffer is Dutch author. He's been writing since 1990 uh, for the Dutch newspaper NSA Handelsblad, and he's a professor at the University of Tilburg, specializing in European studies. Please. Thank you so much uh, for the privilege to be here among you and to share in this a public conversation on one of the great issues of our time. 
question of migration, question of asylum. Let me start off at a personal note. I've been participating the last years in dozens and dozens of public conversations uh, in places uh, where many um, migrants, but definitely also many people seeking asylum um, went in the Netherlands. And in these conversations, I felt an enormous moral energy in the Netherlands. There were always a lot of volunteers willing to help people. And it would be, in my view, a great mistake to overlook that moral energy that is there, that is organizing itself and that is visible in Arnhem, is visible in Zwolle, is visible in Groningen, all the small and medium-sized places, because we don't have large places in this small country. There is a lot of moral energy. And at the same time, there is apprehension about the fact how migration, how asylum is changing our society, how it affects our society. There is doubt, there is uncertainty, there is discomfort. All the shades of emotions can be found. And that led me to asking for myself the question, including myself, in this uncertainty, in this self-doubt. So I would never attribute guilt I would always include myself in an uncertain search. That is where I would begin, by asking myself the question, how can we preserve a moral middle ground in between the propositions of closing the border, populism, but also by rejecting the plea for opening the borders and destroying communities that live within the confines of more or less defined borders, that can be more open, can be more closed. But I think the challenge for us, morally speaking, is how to sustain a moral middle ground in our societies, living up to an obligation, to a moral obligation by defining the scope of that obligation. Why is it so important to sustain this? Because, and that is my second observation, because we're dealing here with a question that will haunt us for the next decades. It's not going to go away. I hear too many saying, well, the Syrian crisis, once that's over, it will sort of fade away. No, it will be there with us for the coming 20, 30, 40 years. Why? Because there are five root causes. Demography, the poorest parts of the world will be the parts of the world where the largest growth of the population will occur. In sub-Saharan Africa, the population in the next 40 years or 35 years will double. More than a billion people will be born in that part of the world, to confine oneself to that part of the world. Secondly, climate change. And of course, there, the industrialized world, including China, bears a huge responsibility. But climate change will disrupt natural environments and will cause people to be on the move. Third cause political instability caused by ethnic division, religious strife, um, corruption, whatever the causes are. Deep causes that cause violent conflict, forcing people to leave their country or being internally displaced within their country. Fourth element to consider is what we call chain migration. Large diasporas are a trigger in themselves for further migration. That is something you can observe throughout history. And of course, the last and perhaps the most meaningful uh, root cause is, of course, the huge disparity in wealth between the North and the South. So these five root causes tell me that migration, asylum, will be the defining features of the next decades. That is why we need long-term solutions. Third observation, is the Netherlands living up to its obligations? There, of course, we can have a discussion, and I don't want to confuse statistics with ethics. I can very well see that we shouldn't do that, but I would just want to confront you with some very basic facts about how Dutch society is changing, refuting all the claims that it is becoming a more and more closed, inward-looking society. It's simply not true. The last 10 years have seen, despite all the populist rhetoric, a record height of immigration in our society, with 1.8 million people arriving in the Netherlands in the last 10 years. We have never, ever in our history seen that many migrants come to the Netherlands as in the last 10 years. 
If we look at the population growth of the Netherlands, the Netherlands has grown with 1.5 million people in the last 20 years. 86% of that growth is due to migration and children being born in migrant families. 86. So that defies, in my view, all the claims based on loose observations, but not on concrete evidence, that the Netherlands is a country that is becoming more and more inward-looking. In fact, it has become a country that is defined by immigration more and more as we speak. So, is the Netherlands living up to its moral obligation? You can discuss it, but I have asked our statistical office, and I don't want to confuse statistics with ethics, but it still gives you a sense of are we living up to our moral obligation? Since the 1980s, the Netherlands has received about three quarter of a million people looking for asylum. Now in the Netherlands are living more than half a million people in those communities that arrived through asylum in the Netherlands. Half a million. You can... Let, let Paul finish. Yes, that's what I'm describing, because if we have had more than three quarter of a million people looking for asylum, and now half a million people are living here, so obviously people have, there are also people who have left. But what I want to say is that, of course, you can dispute whether this is a, a living up to your obligation or not. We will discuss about it, but I would say the Netherlands has proven to be rather an open society and not a closed society. Um, can I finish? Or? Can we okay. do the discussion later, please? Interesting. Two more minutes, uh, Paul. Yes, I will finish within the confines of those two minutes. So, I think one big lesson we learned in Europe is that after the war, there was a refusal to attribute collective guilt to Germany. Guilt is individual. One of the great moral achievements of Europe after the war is the reconciliation with Germany by not attributing collective guilt, but by asking the question of collective responsibility. What is the responsibility of Europe? In four points, I would say Europe doesn't live up to its expectations or obligations. One, it is not a union. So how are we going to criticize a group of 28 countries with different interests, different traditions, by not being a union. The European Union will always fail to live up to its own expectations because it cannot be a union in the proper sense. It's struggling. That's the one. Secondly, I would criticize the European Union strongly for outsourcing its border control to authoritarian regimes. That is a deep moral flaw. By not taking on the responsibility to define your own borders, but by outsourcing that obligation to Turkey, to Morocco, to Libya under Gaddafi. Third criticism of Europe would be that it doesn't have a consistent strategy to tackle the five root causes of migration. And I think it would be prolonging colonialism to say that Europe can make the difference. No, there are a lot of root causes for example, demography, for example, ethnic strife in countries that Europe cannot be held responsible to. Other causes, yes, there is a colonial history. There is the climate change problem. So I would say we need a differentiated, a very much more concrete strategy of what we're doing. Last and two words, the last two words would be that I would say that by asking the European Union to live up to its moral obligations, we should be very careful in a time of mass migration, in a time of disruption of many countries surrounding Europe, to safeguard the moral middle ground and not overstating attributing guilt. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. I invite you to stay uh, there uh, for the question. I failed to introduce uh, Matez before. Uh, thank you very much for your question. Matez is a master uh, in philosophy, and he also um, writes, he's been publishing um, in uh, the Post Online. Now I would like to invite uh, Barak Kalir, who is a professor of anthropology at the University of Amsterdam, and I believe uh, he prepared a question. Thank you for Paul. There's a microphone coming up. Um, please uh, make it brief questions, no statements. Thank you. Yeah. Okay.
Okay, it's not easy to make a brief sta statement, no, but I'll try. I um, basically, I want to ask them two things. One is if we are searching for the middle moral ground, as you put it, um, to what extent can we indeed bracket colonialism? Because I think a lot of the push factors that you describe mm. are, are intimately intertwined with this kind of not only colonial past, but also colonial present. So I think most of the wars that are waged on Africa and, and other countries are European Western war, and that creates this kind of waves of refugees that when we cannot then sort of make a hard cut and say, well, we ask ourselves the moral question only about the receptions of refugees. And the second um, question about the morality is, uh, let me very briefly then state it a bit polemically, would you then not be in favor of quitting, uh, exiting the uh, Geneva Convention? Uh, should Europe stay in the Geneva Convention but then put qualification to what is the extent or the length or the cost that we are willing to bear when we implement it? I see morality as something which you can only ask about a question as are we willing to do as much as we possibly can? And the answer can only be yes or no, and it cannot be yes but. Yes but actually means we are not willing. Thank you very much, Barak. I don't, yeah. have, I don't have much uh, to add to this, but I guess I would like to challenge you also on the proposition of moral middle ground. Um, can you imagine situations in which choosing for the middle ground is being part for, of the problem rather than uh, taking a clear stance on one or the other side? Well, I will take the last question of you and um, the last question of my um, opponent, so to say, but not an opponent, but someone Respondent. asking Respondent. the questions. Um, I would say uh, doing as much as you possibly can. Well, but that is exactly the question. How, what is the scope of your moral obligation and how can you sustain that obligation over 20, 30, 40 years? That is the question I'm asking myself. Some are more generous, some will be more leaning towards a restrictive answer. But at least you cannot escape the moral dilemma if you ask yourself the question in terms of an ethics of responsibility. Not only saying we are confronted with a huge drama, 25,000 people have died in the Mediterranean. I'm very well aware of that. But if you're faced with that, you can have to ask the question, what are the long-term consequences of your acts? So I think we can only sustain an ethics in this question of refugees, when we consider also the long-term consequences of our acts. The first question is, of course, uh, the most crucial question to be asked, but aren't we prolonging a sense of colonialism, post-colonialism, by saying Europe is at fault of all the internal strife, all the problems that other parts of the world are confronted? When the Arab Spring happened, which was a very hopeful event for many, nobody said it was caused by Europe. Everybody thought this was an act of civic courage, of, of responsibility within these countries. So how is Europe going to be responsible for demographic patterns, which are declining, by the way? How is Europe going to be held accountable for forms of corruption? I think we should ask ourselves the question of the agency of countries themselves, of elites, of middle classes. And yes, I think Europe bears a huge responsibility. Huge responsibility. And it should have, that is why I said, my biggest criticism of the European Union, except for not being a union, would be to not have a real policy that directs itself to the root causes, as I've described them, of this migration from south to north. But still, it is in the end, the responsibility of countries, of the African Union, for example, to come up with answers, to criticize Europe, to ask for specific assistance. But I would say, to conclude, it would be far more meaningful if Europe would open up its agricultural markets. It would be far more helpful if we do that than by you know, giving in to a lot of uh, demands that are, in my view, not essential to the progress and the development in many parts of the world. So that would be my answer. But I know it will always fall short because 300 years of history weigh on all of us. On all of us, there's no way to escape that history. But I think in the end, 
it is far more a way to escape the burden of this history to ask for responsibility on all sides than to basically say Europe should solve the problems of others. We've tried to do that. The white man's burden oh. was a huge failure. Thank you very Thank much. You. Well, Paul is getting back to his chair. I'd like to invite our uh, next speaker. Uh, it's a statement that we'll hear from Ogutu Muraya, who's a writer and a theater maker. And I cannot start to mention the places where he has performed already. So we're very happy to have you here, Ogutu. Thank you. Thank you. Over a week ago, I was part of a two-day commemoration of the Hague Congress, or the Congress of Europe, that was held in 1948 in the Dutch parliaments of the Riddersaal, the Hall of Knights. The Congress was an, initi an initiative of Winston Churchill. And in this commemoration, there was a constant adoration, endless quoting, admiration of the visionary leader that Winston Churchill was. And he quotes at the time, 70 years ago, that this is not a movement of parties, but a movement of peoples. But I was struck by Churchill's, and indeed Europe's, limited definition of people. The definition of what it means to be human is not common, not just about people, but includes the environment, non-living and living organisms, indeed a completeness of being. This thought stayed with me as I was preparing my statement in relation to the accusation brought against Europe. I found myself stuck, blocked, and spinning out of coherence. As I am working towards a practice that involves and includes centering on complexity, that for me includes a plurality of voice, including a plurality of voices, a multiplicity of perspectives, and perceptions. And through this, the only way I found to relate to this trial is to by expand the accusation, an interconnectedness with the spirit that, of the mantra that all oppression is related. And I need your help so that each time you hear me saying, say I, you respond by saying I. And the I is a collective, indeed, completeness of being. Say I. I. Say I. I. I call upon the indictment of Europe for its inability to expand its circle of compassion. Unless that circle integrates and assimilates, unless that circle is desirable and likable, it is wealthy, and if not wealthy, it is healthy, an able body that with above average intelligence, its policy of discouragement rooted in eugenics philosophy of limiting unwanted and undesirable traits based on racialization. Say I, I, I call upon the indictment of Europe for crimes against humanity, social injustices, segregation, apartheid, racism, sexism, heteronormative patriarchy. Say I, I, I call upon the indictment of Europe for crimes for Climate injustices, mass extinction, mass pollution, contamination, contamination of water, food insecurity, and the brain drain of human resources that can respond to these challenges in the areas that are most affected. Say I, I, I call upon the indictment of Europe for genocide against first nations, for forced evictions, for impoverishment. Say I, I, I call upon the indictment of Europe for its establishment of a world order that entrenches unequal re structures of power, divide and rule, a civilization project that was power-centered, power-grabbing. Say I, I, I call upon the indictment of Europe for encouraging and enforcing its own citizens, its own economic and political refugees to exp to occupy and settle as settler colonies in Canada, the United States, much of South America, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, and many, many more island nations. Say I, I, I call upon the indictment of Europe for, its, for epistemicides, for stealing and copywriting indigenous knowledges and technologies for the destruction and killing of knowledge systems, of ways of knowing, and its refusal and reluctance to decolonize its curricula, to its institutions of education, its canon, its 
cultural template and cultural archive. Say aye. aye. I call upon the indictment of Europe for slavery. And before we think that this thing is a thing of the past, remember that there are more people enslaved today than there ever were during the transatlantic slave trade. Say aye. aye. I call upon the indictment of Europe for colonialism. And before we think it's a thing of the past, let us remember of the ever morphing neocolonial practices of political control, occupation, ex economic exploitation, and a multinational corporation. Say aye. aye. I call upon the indictment of Europe for its neo neoliberal fetish for productivity, overcoming competi com competi competitors, claiming new tech territories for structural adjustment programs, constant growth, 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 at what cost? At all costs, costs of public health, environmental health, regardless of consumer, regardless of any of these things, consumer saturation with products that have within themselves planned obsolescence. Say aye, aye. I call upon the indictment of Europe for promoting and funding and supplying proxy wars in developing nations. I call upon the indictment of Europe for the assassination of progressive revolutionary readers of post-independent nations. To name just a few from Africa, Patrice Lumumba, Amilka Cabral, Thomas Sankara, Steve Biko, Abu Bakar Bewala, Tom Boyer, Ken Sarowiwa, among many, 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 many more. Say aye. aye. I call upon the indictment of Europe for its resource wars, its refusal to redist for the redistribution of wealth and the growing inequality. Say aye. aye. I call upon the indictment of Europe for its creation of weapons of mass destruction. That nuclear war is a possibility, a latent potential for mad, A-M-A-D, mutual assured destruction. Say aye. aye. I call upon the indictment of Europe for its so-called war on terror, for the creation of unending wars with unaccountable deaths, destruction, and displacement. Say aye. aye. I call upon the indictment of Europe for its refusal to acknowledge, support, protect, and settle, and afford decency to the millions and millions of people living as internally displaced refugees, asylum seekers, whose situation is caused by the centuries of misguided and destructive Eurocentrism. Say aye. aye. I could go on, but I have run out of time. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. And after Ogudu's presentation, I would like to call to the stand Professor Thomas Spikerboer. Thomas Spikerboer is a professor of migration law at the Freie Universität Amsterdam and visiting professor on human rights and humanitarian law, law at Lund University. His research focuses on border deaths and he leads the largest research team on the topic. You have the floor. Thank you. It's the job of lawyers to be boring, so I'll be boring. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, the technicians are will, will be taking care of that. I, I will repeat, it's the job of lawyers to be boring, so I'll stick with the <laughs> job description. Uh, I will uh, take you through a very brief human rights analysis of border deaths of the people who die at the Mediterranean and other borders of the global north. But before doing that, I will abuse my speaking time to congratulate quite a few people in the audience with something remarkable that has happened in this town this week. If you look at the coalition agreement of the new municipal government, you will see that uh, we are here has been given what it wanted at the, at the municipal level. That's remarkable. It's a remarkable success. It was created by people like Eunice and others. Um, and I want to make two remarks about that. One, the left is very bad at claiming this kind of success. I think that has to happen. It has to be celebrated, but it has to be claimed. And secondly, I think the people who were involved have to be aware how vulnerable this is, because there, there's bound to be a backlash from the, the central government. So I think local actors have to get together with local actors in other left-wing dominated cities like uh, Utrecht and Nijmegen to, to prepare for the next uh, stage. So don't celebrate the success, but don't think it will stick all by itself. Okay, now to border deaths. Um, until 1989, there were also border deaths in Europe. 
but they were deaths occurring at borders of countries who tried to prevent exit. So they occurred at the Iron Curtain. At that moment, Europe had a very clear human rights analysis of what happened there. Since 1989, people die at Europe's borders trying to get in. So they, they try at excluding borders. And there's a clear relation between, it's a, these border deaths are a side effect of the success of European policies. Um, I checked the statistics for you, uh, like Paul Schaeffer, I don't want to confuse statistics with ethics, but of every 10,000 passengers arriving at European airports from outside the EU, people flying in from outside the EU, only three don't have the required documents. That means that enforcement of European migration law at foreign ter territories is almost complete. I mean, the, the, the taxation, the belasting deans would faint at this kind of enforcement level. It's an incredible success. But it comes at a price. And the price is death. Death of thousands of people. And there's a very gradual, very slow upward trend. Now, in itself, it seems quite obvious that if, if thousands of deaths are a side effect of a policy that that's a human rights issue. But we shouldn't oversimplify what human rights are, because human rights are two things at the same time. What people, and lawyers are people too, what people tend to emphasize is that human rights protect against the state. But there is a deep ambiguity in human rights, because the protection of human rights comes from the state itself. Human rights treaties are written agreements between states. Human rights laws are products of parliament. And the protection that human rights are, are given are partly given by uh, judges, by courts. And courts are state organs too. So human rights protect against the state, but it's the state that have to give that, that protection. And that's a way of saying that human rights are deeply ambiguous. So you can emphasize that um, individuals are protected against state power by human rights. But you can also emphasize that a state has to act, has to do stuff, and has to sometimes intervene in what people do in order to, to do its core business being, being a state. And part of that is protecting human rights. In the migration emphasis, that second element, in the migration context, that second element is emphasized. If you try to analyze border deaths in terms of human rights, of course you can say, well, like, like the common sense reaction would be, like, dear states, you see a gradual but significant increase of the number of pe people dying as a side effect of your policies. You have to investigate that. You have to look at that. You have to try to figure out how that works and where you could intervene to limit the side effects of your policies. That is not what states do, and European states, in as far as they uh, respond to the issue at all, they say no, 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 because here we emphasize another element of human rights, being that human rights, any human rights reasoning of the European Court of Human Rights starts with emphasizing that states have the right to protect their borders. And sometimes the human rights give individuals uh, a right to interfere with that. So the, 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 the structure that, you, that, you, that I assume you, 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 you think is there, human rights protect people against the state, is here the other, the other way of looking at human rights is emphasized here. Human rights protect the state against intervention by people. So if you want to think about whether thousands of people dying as a side effect of a policy is a human rights violation, we are basically trying to figure out how in this particular context to, to work through that, that inbuilt ambiguity. Thank you very much. I would like now to invite Giza Magendana, the respondent. Thank you. Is the microphone to ask a question? 
Kisa Makindan is a policy entrepreneur and freelance writer. He studied political science and is now working on his first book on what it means to be Dutch. Uh, thank you very much for this contribution. Uh, I had a question prepared and also it connects what you just said. And it's about the moral legitimacy of international conventions as uh, a way to find justice, especially for people who die in the Mediterranean Sea. So because I wonder, and I think you said that these laws are product of time. And it's also connect to what uh, my brother was just mentioning about the definition of a human, the definition of people. And my feeling is that the Geneva Convention and other uh, international conventions were not designed for people who come from the part of the world where I come from. And a good example is maybe the abolition of slavery in the, uh, the late 19th century. There were no any international effort to make sure that such a thing would never happen again. It was only after the Second War, World War that we could say that these international projects, like the United Nations, that result of the Vienna Convention, are, in fact, European projects. So my question is, when it comes to morality and the political dimension of, taking, uh, of asking European responsibility, how legitimate are these international conventions if it is clear from the past and the present that they are not successful enough to make sure that humanity and dignity are not uh, connected to the place where you belong. Thank you. Thank you, Kiza. Before I give you the opportunity to respond, I would like to ask um, my question as well. You have painted a, a quite grave picture this trial today is inspired by the People's Tribunal organized by Bernard Russell and Jean-Paul Sartre in 1966, investigating the intervention, the American intervention in Vietnam and the war crimes committed there. In your opinion, does the present situation in Europe's borders justify this trial, such a trial today? Is the migration crisis Europe's Vietnam? Okay, I'll start with the first question, so I give myself some time to let that uh, sit in the back of my mind. Um, what you in fact emphasize, if I understand you correctly, is that international law is not neutral and that it's tilted, so that it comes from somewhere, that it comes from Geneva and New York and not from Mombasa and Mumbai. I think it's interesting, and there are studies doing that, to look at the counter voices in, in, in international law. Um, what, when the Geneva Convention was drafted in 1950 and 1951, uh, and, and luckily the, there are very precise records of what, what was said, including one of my favorite passages where the, the, the Belgian and the French representative said things to each other uh, that were apparently so unacceptable that the chair proposed not to record them in the minutes. They must have been screaming at each other because what is recorded is bad enough. But there were, there were people, there were representatives of Iraq, of Egypt, and it's very interesting to look at these voices which are usually ignored in the international debate. And one of the many things that went on in the, in the, in the negotiations about the text of the, the, the 1951 Refugee Convention was to what extent uh, third world refugees, and in particular colonial refugees, would be included, yes or no. Um, so there, there is the kind of, 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 of the way of looking that, sh that, you, that, you, that, you, that, you, that you're looking for is there, but it's, it's, it's kind of ignored in mainstream international uh, law because that's still dominated by Northern scholars. So, but there is a counter tradition and it, that's very worthwhile uh, uh, looking at. Um, as, as soon as, uh, as, a com as, as a comparison with Sartre is, is made, I step back. Uh, not my favorite intellectual. Um, I, I find it a very, very difficult uh, thing. I, I was listening to the, to the opening and I get a bit uneasy with people tribunals. 
uh, that's, that's not a tradition I like. Uh, I like, but I like the people. I like the idea of the people tribunal here, because uh, we the people are both the accuser and the accused. And the best thing is we don't have a firing squad. So maybe I do like this. <laughs> Thank you. We shall go immediately to our next speakers. Ahmed Arad and Frank van Dorp will take the stage and will speak together on their common. Can we, oh, there's a moving microphone. Thank you. On their common manifesto. Ahmed Arad is the director of the Open Source and Government Foundation and a freelance IT expert. While distancing himself from right and left thinking, Ahmed declares that he prefers to talk about right or wrong. He has written together with Frank van Dorp a manifesto on migration, integration and asylum policies. Frank van Dorp identifies himself as a worried citizen. He has published on, media, on the media platform Geen Style on issues of migration and asylum policy. He has entered a collaboration with a group of worried citizens being politically active on a wide variety of political issues. You have the floor. Thank you. Um, first of all, uh, well, I, I started to write uh, a day when I got, uh, I got sick, I got the flu, and I was confronted with television and all the talk shows and everyone is calling himself an expert from Arabists to religious experts, etc. And I saw so much misinformation from both sides that I thought this is not a very hard issue to solve. We're currently constantly looking outward to a, a, a higher power, politics, uh, Europe, the government, to solve an issue that is on the basis very uh, easy to solve from a policy point of view. Um, I, I, sent, uh, I, I tried to reach out to especially the right-wing political groups and where do I do that? that I do in the Netherlands on the platform of Geen Stel. I've sent a letter knowing that, or not knowing that it would ever be published. And uh, to my big surprise, it was actually published. This led uh, to much controversy on, the, on their platform itself, um, which resulted in Frank actually replying with his own article. And he, doesn't, he also doesn't work for Geen Stel. That went back and forth for a couple of times where I suggested maybe it's time for us, just readers of this platform, to, uh, to collaborate, collaborate over a period until we have a manifesto or some uh, fundamental principles of policy that we, would, that we would accept. Not to achieve something, not to give it to a political party, but just to see if we citizens can actually solve a problem. Uh, over a period of a year, with more than 40 people that voluntarily put their time in this, um, we actually managed to create a, a complete report on the immigration and uh, uh, migration and propose our ideas um, in, in such a way that they are uh, applicable within the current laws, within the current treaties, and has a, whole, a huge role for us as citizens. Uh, about this, I think Frank can tell a little bit more. Uh, yes, because, uh, well, this uh, afternoon we're talking about uh, whether Europe or the EU or its citizens are, uh, well, uh, guilty or neg negligent in their treatment of refugees in, uh, in Europe. And I think uh, when we are sitting together and with a couple of civilians from all political sides and we, can, we could get together some very, well, sensible solutions, things that work, well, then I think it's clearly isn't uh, the fault of the European people that uh, nothing has happened, but because uh, the Europe European citizens, normal people in the streets, they have actually quite good ideas. They are really, uh, they are really interested, interested in uh, solving this problem, in helping people. It is not their fault that no one is willing to listen to them. That's the fault of the, of the European Union and, and the politicians. And I will give a few examples of uh, solutions uh, we had, which I think uh, we think the European Union could have implemented a long time ago. For example, why isn't there a common uh, refugee policy in Europe? Why, if, any, if, 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 if a crisis occurs somewhere in the world and a refugee uh, inflow occurs, why is everyone run, running through each, through each other and 
completely panicking and no one knows what to do. How incompetent is this? I mean, how could we... Why isn't there a common refugee policy that we always know in advance? This is what we are obliged to do. This is uh, how we are going to spread the refugees over the nation states. This is uh, the rights the refugees have. This is how we are going to... Uh, to, to, to make sure we get uh, people in who really deserve our hospitality and, and keep the people out who would only abuse it because they don't have, don't have the right to, to enter. All of these questions, uh, they are all, always decided on an ad hoc, ad hoc basis. Another example is our border policy. Uh, as previously mentioned, we all look towards Greece and Italy and expect them to, uh, to, 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 to protect our borders and to keep illegal immigrants out. Why aren't we sharing that burden with each other? Another thing is the, uh, the why isn't there a possibility for uh, refugees, for, for, for a better pol policy for, for legal migration? Why do people have to travel through, through thousands and thousands of miles of deserts and get into boats to get, enter the country I illegally if they have a right to enter our countries a bit based on their refugee status they deserve? Why can't they just go to uh, somewhere closer to their countries, to a diplomatic post, and ask for, um, apply for migration there so they don't have to go in, in one large uncontrolled stream and take up all kinds of other people who don't deserve it to, uh, in, inside that stream. So it's those uh, policies, those can very easily be implement, implemented and it's, it's policies that everyone from the left to the right could agree on in our group and we think could agree on in our society because no one wants to see children drown. And, but everyone wants to keep our continent safe. That's, that's what we all want. That's, that's not something that is, is in conflict with each other. And no one wants to... Uh, we all want people who deserve asylum, who are really uh, imperiled to be able to enter our country. And we, and, but we also don't want... Also, it's also in their interest that we keep the people out who have caused them to flee their, their country in the first place. Like, for example, the, what we know in the Netherlands, uh, the homosexual refugees who, who were threatened inside, the asylum, uh, inside some of the asylum seeker centra. So it's in, the, it's, in the, it's in the interests of everyone, of the Dutch people, of the European people, of all the refugees, of all, everyone who comes in, to have, some, to have these very sensible policies in place. Well, and I think also finally, refugees uh, and uh, uh, immigrants have become uh, a political capital of sorts for political parties. You have on the left side people that actually benefit from uh, right-wing parties and the other way around. It's better, pol it's politically more sound to keep, a, a, to keep a problem in place than to actually solve it. Because by keeping it in place, you can keep pushing your agenda on it without solving anything. Europe, in this case, can keep pushing that we need more European integration to solve these problems. Well, there's no singular risk research saying that that it might work or not, or that we might, or that we need to invest, like Funk said, in a, a common uh, investment or a common uh, border uh, uh, policy. Um, so we found out that we, as people, people that don't know each other, that just met on a forum that is described by most of the people as a hate blog, are capable of creating something constructive. And that is our uh, point that we want to uh, sh uh, share with you, that if even complete strangers with no direct uh, relation to this problem can come up with these solutions, how come a complete European Parliament, several uh, parliaments in all the 28 member states and the European Commission cannot come up with the same solutions? Thank you. Thank you very much to the speakers. I would like to invite the respondent, Lidewijde Bergmoes. Lidewijde is a research and anthropologist at the Netherlands Institute for the Study of Crime and Law Enforcement at the University of Amsterdam, where she has been studying the long-term and long-distance effects of conflict. Um, hello, thank you very much. I um, want to say a few things about the manifest that you have uh, created together. Uh, I think the initiative to try and create a bridge uh, between left and right is quite applaudable. 
But I have some serious doubts about whether this manifest is actually able to do so. When I was reading it, um, I felt that lots of the points of departure of this manifest are maybe not so different as we see currently in the policy. Uh, for instance, the emphasis on a selective migration policy and approaching asylum seeker refugees uh, with suspicion rather than a responsibility of protect. Um, and also, I was wondering, some of the concrete measures uh, didn't always seem to be grounded in how we know that people act in migration and asylum seeking situations actually evolve. Uh, for instance, if we uh, oblige um, uh, refugees to apply uh, to uh, diplomatic posts, uh, when a conflict evolves, often the first thing, especially in the period of crisis that happens in these diplomatic posts, is that the staff is being evacuated. So I think practically I also have some doubts about whether this is feasible. Um, but they are maybe details and we, uh, you could try and solve them. But the major difference that I found that stood out actually from what you have written and from what is currently being done is that you plea for a simplification. And uh, in a way that we no longer make exceptions. Uh, and uh, while this is also sounds very nice, I think that um, the reality is often much more complex than we may want to wish and want to contain in a policy. And also that a lot of the exceptions that we have now are perhaps uh, caused by the fact that we want to keep, uh, uh, keep up values such as um, uh, uh, fulfill uh, um, international law and human rights obligations. So my question to you is actually, do you propose for the sake of a simplified uh, policy uh, also compromising our values or the human rights that we actually also as the Netherlands, as Europe, advocate for in the rest of the world? Well, uh, Thank you very much. Before, before I give you the floor again, I would like to take one more question from the audience, from the jury this time. Is there anyone who would like to address the question at this point? There are not going to be many opportunities. Yeah, I'm just uh, wondering, because you mentioned um, uh, not making a distinction between left or right, but talking about right or wrong. But I was wondering what you think is right or what you think is wrong. Isn't that also not an objective measure, but also subjective also coming from what you believe, uh, also from your political colors, from your background. So, I mean, think about what is right. Isn't it a little bit uh, misleading? That's what, I, that's what I was wondering. Thank you very much. Please. Okay, to start with the first question, um, uh, with simplification, I ran into this problem myself. Um, I found myself, uh, eventually it was 2015, that there was actually a difference be between someone who has a residence permit and someone who has the Dutch nationality. And I, want to, I wanted to become more politically uh, active, needed to work for uh, several parties in parliament. And then I thought, well, this might be just something administratively that I can take care of. I was so wrong, because uh, even that I have been uh, since 1984 in the Netherlands, studied here, went to school here, worked all the time, um, there were extremely complicated procedures from the Immigration uh, and Naturalization uh, Office that required not only uh, a, a lawyer, in, in this case Will Eichelbaum, but also uh, Greenberg Traurig as an international uh, lawyer firm to intercede to get me my Dutch nationality. Uh, I had to answer questions as, yeah, between this period and that period, you weren't registered in a certain, uh, uh, you weren't registered with your municipality that you lived somewhere. I said yes, because I was living in the house of a diplomat that uh, is working in Portugal. And they were like, yeah, but you could not prove that. I said, well, here you have all the rent payments from a Dutch bank account to a Dutch bank account, the rental agreement, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, and they still didn't accept it. The only course of action was actually going to court and threatening them, not only in the courts in the Netherlands, but also in the courts of Portugal where this diplomat actually was. So are we, do we need simplification in this process? Yes, because it's extremely bureaucratic. Um, as to the second uh, question uh, between right and wrong, I see it as there is no, there is no politically, political way to solve a technical problem. There is no PVV or uh, a GroenLinks way to screw in a light bulb. 
there is a certain problem, and the problem uh, is that you have immigrants coming here that you want to activate, that you want to have contributing to society uh, in, any kind of, uh, in any case or form, and if you have no right to be here, if you cannot uh, be objectively uh, uh, be classified as a refugee, then you shouldn't be here. And refugees that are here, those are the people that you want to help, not only in this country, but also in their country of, the, uh, of origin, because you have uh, uh, a role uh, to play in it. You have to play an active role to make a, a country stable again. So there is a right and there is a wrong. Um, and, and it doesn't come from any political party as far as we see it. Uh, do you want to add something to it? Oh no, I, I completely agree with everything, <laughs> especially the especially the point about uh, yeah maybe just one thing that when, when Mr. Noor was talking that he was about ten years in uh, f before you knew what you were oh. getting twelve years. Well, that's the kind of thing we really don't want to see anymore. That you cannot uh, it's inhuman to to subject any immigrant to twelve years of uncertainty before uh, they know what they're up what they're up to. So. Simplification, we really need it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the next stage is where I'd like to invite a group that we have called witnesses to what's actually happening to them in Europe to come forward. And these are from the group of We Are Here, from the group Bed, Bad Brood, the overnight shelter group and also uh, the Refugee Collective of Lampedusa and the Refugee Protest Camp in Berlin, which I have uh, actually seen with my own eyes. Um, we have here, will you say your own names? Yeah, my name is Haysam Melkarmut. Yes, and, so uh, say your name yeah, and I'm one of the name. witnesses today, but before I start my witness, I want to say something to Mr. Paul Schiffer, right? Briefly, please. Yeah. So uh, I want to ask you, do you know how much the EU sent weapons to Africa and to dictators there? Do you know? OK. So stop sending weapons and supporting dictators in Africa and everywhere, and then you will not see any refugee here. Yeah. I have been a witness of many crimes that you, the EU committed towards refugees. But there is one crime I want to talk about now. I arrived to the airport, Schiphol Airport, in 2016, and I applied for asylum. And the second thing I know, they took me to a prison. And I stayed there for more than one year. It's called Schiphol Detention Centrum. We were in the same building with criminals that have been involved in stealing and drugs and other criminal activities. I have seen many people trying to commit suicide in the detention. And some of them become crazy and sick. Then they take them to a uh, psychiatric hospitals. And after you spend the detention period, you never know how long it is. They put you on the street without anything, any rights. They just put you, OK, you are free now, free to go. Without any basic rights. No shelter, no food, no money, no nothing. You're not allowed to work. I think if we are allowed to work, then we will have a normal life, kind of. But we are not allowed to do anything. And if they stop you again in the street to check your ID or whatever happened, then they take you again to the detention. It happened with me before two months. The police stopped me and they said, oh, you're illegal here. I said, yeah, but I didn't do anything. Why are you talking about this? I said, yeah, if I want to take you to detention now, I will. And I didn't say anything. Then he said, OK, go now. Uh, yeah. This circle from detention to street, from street to detention, it never ends. And I know a lot of people who 
have been in detention for five or six times. And now they got a residence. They approved their asylum. So I don't know why and what it changed. Why putting people in detention in the first place? If you are after five or 10 or 12 years, you're going to give them asylum and give them permission to, to live here. Why you put them in detention in the first place? We are not criminal. Still, we are put in, into prison. This is a violation of human rights and we should hold the EU accountable for it. How come human rights are not applicable to us? Are we are not human? That was it. Thank you. Thank you very much. The Honourable Judge, good evening, good e afternoon. I'm good in actor. I'm good actor. But I'm not good in lying. In this country, people are being accept accepted by, by just hearing the story. Does this person telling the truth or not? Is it true or false? I lost the possibility to live a normal life because I'm just not good on telling my story. I was 17 years old when I was when I came here. Uh, they brought me in the small office. They call it as they call it interview. I had been in same similar office like this in Sudan before they hit me. I was very afraid. There was a big Dutch man in front of me. He's keeping asking me questions. I got very afraid. I know people in Europe treat people nice, but not in my country, not in Sudan. I didn't know what to do and what to say. I was very stressed. The Dutch guy showed me the village, my village, in a, in a map. And he asked me, is this is my village? Is this is your village? I never saw in my, I never saw in my village in the map. I never saw even Sudan in map. I only wanted to go out from that office, from that interview, because remember me, a lot of bad memories. It would be different if me and this guy we had sitting in somewhere else, not in that place, normal place. It will be different. And he can understand what I have, to, I have said, what I have want to tell. But we are standing in, we are in the office. And so he didn't believe me because I'm, I'm not reality at that moment. I'm not good in telling my story. Other people live in normal life, live the, the normal life because they are good in telling the story, telling them story. I have been in a lot of different squad, squad places between 2013 till 2017, moving from place to place. I'm a human without rights. I never had passport in my life. To prove who you are, you need the documents from the country that you, you escaped from it. So imagine I would, I would have been enemy of this state here in Netherlands. 
and I would run away. And then I can, I can just normally, simply ask the Netherlands, can you please send me my documents? I come by a boat. If you succeed in that trip to pass the sea, you will know how much of risk you have taken. At, at these years on the street, is nothing compared to, to 10 minutes from that trip. All this year on the street, for me, it's not like 10 minutes from that trip on the sea. You see yourself dying, and again, and then suddenly you feel like you are alive again. I didn't know what it was Europe before I came here. I didn't have a plan. I know Holland because of the flowers. I know Holland because in Sudan I was, I was, I was, I was so a publicity, the publicity in uh, the college uh, made in Holland. I know Holland, but I never heard about Netherlands. When I was in Italy, people were, were asking, where are you going? I heard someone, he saying, I'm going to Holland. I said, hmm? Okay. I thought people must be very nice people with, with, with flowers. <laughs> in that trip, in the sea, in my trip, there is was a boy named after me. His name is Sinan, now I think. He is must be like five years old now. On the boat, there was a pregnant woman she wants to deliver. She was bleeding. I tried to help. Suddenly, I had blood, bloody baby hood in my hand. I felt the navel cord in my, between the mother and the child. And then we are not allowed to take anything in that boat. When we was in the boat, from Libya, they research you, you are not allowed to take anything sharp in your body, even this belt or watch or anything. And that moment when I see the court, the navel between the mother and the child, I, should, I said I should do something. And I just cut it with my teeth. And the boy survived. And when we arrived to Italy, the mother asked me, what's your name? When the ambulance came and they took her, they put her in the bed, she hold my hand and she asked me, what's your name? I told her, my name is Sinan. She told me, okay, I'm gonna give this boy this name. So there is a boy named after me. His name is Sinan now. And this is why I'm happy. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <sir. laughs> Elizabeth? <laughs> Elizabeth, please. Yeah. Um, my name is uh, Elizabeth. Uh, I come from Nigeria. Uh, I was in Netherlands since uh, 2012. That is six years ago now. Uh, I have a resident permit of Netherlands before, but they took it back. But uh, since when they took it back, uh, they told me to go to my country, uh, which uh, I had, um, I, I didn't go, but my lawyer tried to let them know that uh, the ladies is uh, not a uh, good heel, but the IND refused uh, that, oh no, this, that. But since that, since that time, I was uh, with Legacy House almost two years. Uh, the Legacy House says, oh, we cannot help you. We only help the people that they have documents. Now, now your document is fine. I was, okay. Then I came to uh, Amsterdam. 
to go and see the Kemente. Now I'm sleeping in BBB. Uh, but what is happening now is that uh, I'm sleeping in BBB, but uh, it's not that it's convenient because uh, I'm talking uh, on behalf of the people that we are sleeping in BBB and on behalf of uh, the people that, uh, that we don't have a document. Because all the people that we don't have a document, uh, IND, they, they don't recognize us or uh, UN or whatever. They don't recognize us like a refugee. They think that we are, maybe we are with ourselves. Which we are sleeping in BBB, we don't have money, nothing, no any income, anything. We go out in the morning and come back in the evening, which uh, is not easy for me like, as, as a woman. Uh, I will want to use maybe toilet or buy toilet throw, buy pad or using coins money or anything which uh, we don't even have any access of that where we are sleeping. Uh, and again, we sleep like two people in the room, 10 people in the room, which is not convenient. Uh, everybody have uh, the whole, uh, his own sickness. Then uh, when you, uh, again, oh, you go to doctor, when you have resident permit, when you go to doctor, the doctor will treat you good. Like, okay, you have a resident permit because I'm talking about the experience. The time that I have a resident permit, I know when I go to the doctor, there's, I know how they are, the medicine I want to use, they give me because they know that I have a good insurance that I can pay or do stuff. Then, uh, and um, by that time, I'm working with, uh, with social. Before, by that time, when I went, the time that they give me resident, until the resident finished and they stop it. And again, the, but now, when you go to hospital now, although they are trying, because at least some medic some medical they will say, oh, oh, you are okay, even though you are if if you are if until you are dying like this, they will say, Okay, oh, uh, okay, okay, let us give you something. Because when you go to because you don't have insurance, they will say, Oh, you are okay, okay, go and use paracetamol or go and use something. And we people we are sleeping in BBB, most of us we are not in good health and we are we are dying small, small. But uh, I want the audience to just look and help us and do something with, with, uh, with us that we are sleeping in BBB to help. We, at least for him, we have right to be collecting some money and to do something for ourselves and we want to gain our life back. Some, some of them, some of us that you are there, it's not that we cannot work. We can work, we can do something. They should accept us as a woman being to look our case. Moreover, I, I came from Nigeria. They think all the people that we came from Nigeria, oh, our country is good, you have a oil in your country. But I, when they go to the inside of Nigeria, they will know what is happening there. My country is not good. I'm talking about all the um, behalf of Nigerian people. They say, oh, Nigeria is 419, so this is, but not all the Nigerians. Many countries are doing something that's bad more than Nigerians. But people are saying, oh, Nigeria, from there, they will say, oh, anywhere we go, they say, oh, Nigeria, they are doing it. They have to look our case and see what is they can do for us. We came here to gain our life, not to, not to, not to spoil their country. We love Netherlands too much. That is why you see so many Nigerians in Netherlands, and uh, it's not that they are doing something stupid. Elizabeth, can you slowly go towards the end? OK, Thank so you. they should please uh, do something for us, we, we, we need help. They should take us like a woman being too. And uh, they will say, oh, okay, you don't have a resident permit, you cannot do this, you cannot do that. They should erase this, um, uh, this thing for us that uh, they should treat us like, even though they don't give us 100%, at least we need 19% to give us to do something like a woman being too. Maybe to go to, if you want to go to school, you go to school. If you want to work, you can work. You can do this, you Thank can you. do that. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Teferi, I think. Yeah. I am Teferi. Coming August, it will be my 17th year here in Netherlands. I don't regret for coming here. It saved my life, but I suffered a lot. I cannot excuse my rights. When you reach Europe, you think it is a peaceful continent and that human rights are respected. 
I ran away from Ethiopia, but I, I and the dean always asks me for papers from Ethiopian authorities. Birth certificate, identification paper, even paper of arrestment from the police that took me into custody. What is IND thinking? Those people will not give paper in which they state that they have arrested and tortured me. I was in asylum centers in Reisbergen, Oss, Dillen, and Delphi. After that, I was out of procedure for five years. In 2008, I got arrested for crossing red light by bicycle. I was there for seven months. They call it a detention center, but uh, it is a prison. Then they didn't have the right to keep me longer than six months. Within time, this became nine months, and now they can even keep people for a year. After seven months, they put me back on the street and told me to leave the country within 48 hours. But the judge granted me a compensation for the extra one month, and this money could come in three months. So I waited and I entered into procedure for the second time. I went to Dembosch, then Terra Apple, to be fingerprinted again. Then they sent me to Busum. After a while, they wanted to dismantle that camp and they dis dispersed us all over the country. So they sent me to Eman and then to Dragton. In front of the place is a huge police station bigger than I ever saw in my life. When I was dropped by the bus driver, I first saw the police station, not as they say. After Dragton, my second application was rejected again. And uh, because they don't ble believe I'm Ethiopian. They brought a translator who spoke Amharic, my native language from Ethiopia, but they still don't believe I'm Ethiopian. Soon, I will go for a new interview at IND in Dembosch, probably next month. I don't know what to tell them. They know me for the last 17 years. I have no new information and they have no new question, I think. Ethiopia is unstable already for 40 years. And the European community starts pushing African countries to accept political refugees. Although they call it development aid, the EU gives Ethiopia more than 124 million euros a year. The authorities can keep that money only if they accept refugees back into the country and secure Europe's interest in Africa. This money never reached the public. When I first arrived here, I got the right to stay one year. During that year, I received a three months work permit. That was in 2002. I was able to do small jobs, working with farmers, picking up apples. In that time, everyone I met welcomed refugees. People were more open. Today, people are afraid of Islamization and refugee invasion. Far-right politicians have implanted negative thoughts in the minds of the public. European politicians become like African politicians because they only listen to themselves. That is what we exercise in Africa. Thank you. My name is Hidaya Nampima. I come from Uganda. I stand before you because the Dutch asylum system has failed me. I arrived in the Netherlands nine months ago, and personally, I have a very bad experience with uh, the IND. To begin with, my interview was a, 
a very big challenge to me because the questions that were really asked, most of them were very intimate. To be precise, I belong to the LGBT community. Where I come from, in our daily life, we don't normally talk about the kind of people we are because we fear to be judged by society, the friends, religious leaders, and all our neighbors. In the European community, it's very normal to talk about who you are. It's very normal to decide the kind of person you want to be. But what I feel since I came here, I can easily confide in anybody the kind of person I am. I was very perturbed during my interview because um, IND did not believe my story. Well, in my story, to be brief, I was sexually molested when I was very young. And IND really questioned me why I had to tell them that I was sexually molested. I mean, if you need to hear my story, you need to hear exactly what happened to me. After a long session of about nine hours for my interview, all didn't go well, and uh, I was supposed to go to court. Uh, during my court session, I indeed strongly stressed they didn't be believe my story. Well, I've gotten a few friends who have uh, been successful through their asylum procedure, but if you look through very well, you don't see anything specific that they're really best on to give them the status. I understand Andy did not really listen to me very well. I have a feeling I didn't get a chance to explain myself really well. And to be honest, some questions were really very vague. In, this, in the asylum centers where we live, that is called the, the Azad Seeds, we denied the right to education. I mean, if I stay in the Azad Sea for like um, two years without attending school, and then maybe after the fourth year I'm granted my asylum, my three years are wasted. So I believe we really have the right to education, to learn more about the Dutch society, and also to exercise our experiences. When I was given a letter of 28 days to leave uh, uh, the Netherlands, I was really very tense. I really didn't know what to do. I was invited by the DTNV to talk about my status. I told them, yeah, despite the fact I've not been given permission to stay, it doesn't really feel like my problem is solved. Uh, the lady who talked to me, she said, if you do not comply, we will forcefully take you back to your country. I wonder who decides upon this. I would feel there should be an independent body to investigate situations of the countries where we come from. In my honest opinion, if I get a chance to do my interview again, and maybe get another lawyer, I think I'm in a better position to talk more about myself, and hopefully I'll not be judged this time, and all the decision will be best on my decision, on, on, my, on my report that I would have given, or my detailed story. Thank you very much. Thank you, for all, uh, thank you for all your statements. I will try it also to reflect some of them in, in my summing up remarks. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, we move on to the next speaker, Herman Weischer. I invite you to the stand.
My version is a Dutch sociologist and a writer with special interests in affairs of social morality, religion, and spatial planning. And Manvasha has also extensively written on uh, the concept that we call political correctness. I know it's a summary, but I invite you to uh, give your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, three years ago, there was a discussion in Dutch newspaper, the Volkskrant, about the terminology that may be used to describe the influx of refugees to Europe. The question was, was it permitted to use words that were derived from the Dutch struggle against the sea, like a storm current, or a flood, or a, fl a wave, a wave that would flood our country if we did not take measures to constrain it? Politically correct opinion makers argued this terminology is undesirable, as this water comparison implies that the influx of refugees is a problem, even a menace something we must contain. By using the water metaphor, we would foster negative feelings about refugees and as a consequence reduce the willingness of Europeans to take in considerable, considerable amounts of them. These opinion makers argue we should associate the flow, the flow of refugees with gladness and gratitude. Refugees offer a welcome, even necessary, addition to our labor force in an aging Europe. And they enrich our multicultural society with fresh ideas, new habits, and novel cultural orientations. But do these claims about positive contribution of re refugees to our society, do these claims stand statistical scrutiny? Unemployment rates among, among refugees are staggering. In a recent report, CBS, the Dutch Investigation Office, concluded that two and a half years after receiving their residence permit, 90% of asylum seekers is still dependent on Social Security. In another recent investigation, another government institution, VRR, revealed that the multicultural society does not always provide an enrichment of the social environment, even to the contrary. An increase of social and cultural diversity proves negative for criminality rates and social cohesion. So we see that these positive stories are highly unlikely and at least unproven. They lack credibility and I think this is an alarming conclusion because people don't like to be fooled when it comes to sensitive subjects like this. Fake good news stories make them distrustful towards authorities and will diminish their willingness to go along with the refugee quota the European Commission allocated for their country. That is one reason why we should, in my opinion, restrain from telling these good news stories. <clears throat> and there is another reason to do so, to, re to refrain from these stories, a more important one. The whole discussion about the positive or negative contribution of refugees is irrelevant, even shameful. When we look to Eastern European countries like Hungary and Poland, we see the mirror image of the good news stories. There, bad news stories about refugees are told, even propagated by the governments. Refugees would constitute a menace for the national Christian identity of the population, and therefore, these countries bluntly refuse to take in their fair share. We should, I think, strongly back the attempt of the European Commission to force these countries by all means to fulfill their quota. Taking in refugees is a moral obligation. The question whether we like these people, whether their habits differ from ours, or whether they are able to offer an economic contribution should not be of any importance when it comes to people who have to flee for their life. We should emphasize their right to travel to a safe place, and we should do our utmost to offer, and offer them such a place. Telling good or bad news stories about their contribution to our society only serves to distract us from this obligation. Thank you, Ed Lachbaren. Thank you very much. I invite you to st stay on the stand, uh, and I invite Jay-Z uh, who's prepared a question as a respondent. Um, as a member of the Council in Amsterdam for the party Bayen, 
and as an activist, among others, connected to the decolonization network, former Dutch East Indies. Yes, thank you for sharing your story. Um, so I'm thinking because I prepared a question that was um, focused on one of the things that you wrote before that you sent me, but I, did, I didn't think you said it, said it now, so I'm thinking whether to respond uh, on that or say my question anyway. Um, you can push your question, I mean... Uh, Okay, so Anything yeah, goes. so I'm curious um, because because what you wrote was that it's like that it's problematic. Um, uh, what is happening with the influx of refugees and the situation is only becoming worse. And also what you said now that we cannot um, that we that we have to acknowledge that this is a problem and that it changes uh, society in a in, in 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 a negative way, as I understood it. Well, I wouldn't say that. I would say it, we have to acknowledge it's a problem because we cannot. Uh, accept the whole flow of refugees. Okay, cool. Uh, so, yeah, let, then let that be the, the starting point, because I think it is indeed problematic when uh, people have to flee away from their country as a result of war, uh, poverty, climate chaos, oppression, or political persecution. Uh, nevertheless, European states and European multinationals uh, keep on exploiting, polluting, and bombing countries in the global south, and also selling weapons and working together with dictators in, in countries like Saudi Arabia and Egypt. And um, so what you wrote about before was about um, dealing with um, the, the problems related to refugees. You, you were speaking about controlling uh, migration, so how to control migration mm -hmm. in a good way. So I would say that if we want to deal with this topic, we should uh, look at the root of the problem instead of uh, just trying to find ways to deal with uh, what is the outcome. So my question to you is, to what extent do you think that the European Union is complicit, uh, for example, through their economical and military policies, in creating and upholding uh, reasons why people flee? And also, uh, why do you search for a solution in controlling migration? Um, uh, yeah, why do you search for a solution in controlling migration instead of uh, dealing with the reasons why people flee in the first place? Thank you, Thank you. very much for that question. I'm going to add something very brief, um, and it, it relates to um, your call to maybe not just decide to be political correct or not. So I, I'd like to challenge you on um, the importance of discourse, and obviously that's something that you would also say. So whether we choose to call it a flood, make references to water, and in a positive way, you would say maybe it's not that bad because we've been able to manage a lot of the uh, water well, no, problems that no. we had. Um, so I would, I would, I would, I mean, following uh, that. That logic, I would say, is there not a danger if we um, attribute labels to people that are not considered as human, let's say, while we do not um, use labels to call ourselves the people or the citizens yeah. of Europe that might also be related to nature, potential danger or not. So I'm not necessarily challenging the fact that we shouldn't use uh, metaphors of, of water. But if we still make a distinction between those that come in, they seem to be forces of nature, but we continue to be the norm. So yeah. if you can respond very okay. briefly to both questions. Um, I think the, uh, we in, in Holland we have a tradition of dealing with this water yeah, problem. That's problem. what I was referring to. And we are rather successful in that. And there's a modern approach to water management which says we have to have a flexible response to the problems the sea puts to us. You, uh, formerly we just made dikes, big dikes, with concrete and to keep the water out. <clears throat> and now we say no, we have to work together with the sea. We have to open to, to allow the water to, to uh, enter the country in some places. We have to make soft and, and flexible borders with the sea. Um, and I think this is a good metaphor. This, uh, we could use this metaphor. Uh, I even would say that the European leaders would follow a course of Dutch water management in order to realize what you can do to deal with a strong force like this, a force that will continue. You know? um, then about the, of the, the, the gentleman who said we have to look to the causes. Of course, I agree with that. We have to look to the, to the roots of the whole problem. Um, only, I think, it's one-sided to just say the European Union or the European countries, the West, 
is responsible for the problems that gave birth to the current of, uh, of refugees. Uh, maybe I can answer you with a little story. I just uh, very brief story, please. A very brief story, of course. Um, I just returned from Suriname, the former Dutch colony in South America, and I, uh, I took a trip to the hinterland there, and I saw a lot of trucks, trucks, big trucks, loaded with three trunks, big three trunks. And I asked my, my companions, where is it going to? And they said, well, this is going to China. China is buying Suriname in many respects. Those trunks are to be processed not in Suriname. They go straight to China. There they will be processed and stuff will be, will be made from it. So the problem is not only Europe. It's, only, it's also China. And I would add, uh, it's also the government of Suriname in this, in this case, because the government of Suriname made the deal with China in a very, uh, in a very short-term policy. So we sell, we sell our natural riches now. We, we don't care about our own future generations. This is a cor corrupt government, a gangster government in Suriname. And it's a gangster government, I'm sorry to say, that is elected by the people. So this is, this is a, a bad situation. I'm just telling this story to... The Dutch, to, to, Dutch to government didn't leave any gold eggs. <laughs> uh, Haitan, we'll come to the... Uh, I, we'll I agree with you that the Dutch, Dutch government could have made a completely different policy, but that's I not the issue now. Haitan, Haitan, okay. leave this for later. We have time left. I think this is uh, my answer to the... On the Thank table. you very much. Thank, Thank you very much. much. May I invite your chatty? Uh, I think you've noticed we are running out of time. Uh, we are half an hour behind. So please, if you could limit it to five minutes. Thank you. The chatty Oziri, please. Um, I stand here in front of you as a witness in a court case. A contemporary witness gives an account of time he or she has experienced and which now passed into history. I cannot tell about the time I have experienced, but I can tell about the time I have not experienced, the time that was stolen from me. And for that I have five minutes, so starting now. <laughs> On the days when my mother had to go to the immigration office with me and my old sister, my older sister, we didn't have breakfast. We left the apartment so early that there weren't any buses yet. We walked into the city center in the morning, bags of bread with butter and salt in our hands, which we quickly made earlier. My mother always said, if we're the first and take a number straight away, it won't take too long, promise. That was never true, actually. Even when my mother and my sister and I reached the immigration office before it was even open, there was already an endless queue of people standing in front of the glass door. Then we took a number and a seat on the chairs in the long, quiet corridor. Sometimes my sister and I played some games in Whisper. Sometimes I did my homework there. Sometimes I just stared at the picture with the sunflowers in front of me for hours. Now and then the grown ups stood up and walked around because their backs hurt from sitting so long. When we got hungry, we ate the breads we made in the morning. It wasn't rare that an official would send us home again in the evening without, without us having had our turn. When at some point our number did flash up on the display, my mom ran into the office, my sister and I walked right after her. Then it usually only took a moment. The officer speaks, my mom tries to say something, he gives her a pink, a green or a yellow piece of paper, that's it. In the evening we go home and as years passed, I began to understand that there were many mornings and days like this to come. And indeed, it took me 18 years. Each and every one of those days in a corridor was a day in transit. It meant a day I didn't spend in school investing in my education. Instead, I had to wait again in school, this time in front of the teacher's offices, to explain to another official person why I was missing in school from that day. It meant a day I didn't spend with my friends playing football, a day I didn't spend learning an instrument, a day my sister could have spent with her first summer love. Our years had fewer days, our clocks had fewer hours, our youth was a little bit shorter than the others. And more important, it meant one day less pay for my mother, who worked part-time to earn a little extra. I myself never migrated anywhere. I was in this statelessness uh, group that you mentioned. But I understood for some reason I had less time, because I was waiting always. 
In the first few weeks of the school year, I waited for schools, I, wa I waited for school books from the social services, while all the other kids already had their books. I waited at state borders, where my strange papers were checked for hours, while all other people just went through. I waited 18 years until I finally got the citizenship of a country. The real effect of asylum law, among others, is the intentional prolonging of the periods of time in which certain people are dependent. A flight from Beirut to Amsterdam takes eight hours. That's one working day in Europe. In the 21st century, Beirut is eight hours away. But asylum seekers often have to travel for months and years. They wonder, we all heard this. Even if they can't completely legally come according to, Europe, to current law, they are not allowed to fly it because the airlines have to carry risk and cost. It could be eight hours. A right which a person is entitled to on paper is made impossible to implement in reality because of a politics of time. And I disagree that this is just a technological, a technical problem. Behind this bureaucracy, there is an internet, there is an intention. In Germany, the minister of crime, the minister in Germany, the minister for the interior wants to introduce so-called anchor centers where 1,500 asylum seekers have to hold out for months, probably years, in a building surrounded by barbed wire fences until the application for asylum has even been decided. I'm not talking about whether the application is granted or denied. I'm just talking about the time that is robbed from these people anyway. And even if someone is finally granted his official residency status, once again, an endless number of micro-mechanisms of power kick into action to keep robbing these people of their time. Think about how much longer it takes to find a job with a non-European uh, last name or uh, with the status of an asylum seeker, to find a job, a, a doctor's appointment, a flat, just everything. How many times did I as a child had to hear that I had to be twice as good as the others? The phrase twice as good doesn't just mean being satisfied with the half. Twice as good requires twice the amount of time. But your time is permanently robbed, and that's exactly how the micro-mechanisms of power make it impossible to ever really arrive. A lot of the problems that you were mentioning, immigrants were the problem, is because they don't have the time to arrive. I would like to kindly ask you to start coming to the end. Yes, I do. Thank you. Tony Morrison writes, this is time, <laughs> uh, the very serious function of racism is distraction. It keeps you from doing your work. It keeps you explaining over and over again your reason for being. Somebody says you have no language and you spend 25 years proving that you do. Somebody says your head isn't shaped properly and you have scientists working on the facts. Somebody says you have no art and you dredge that up. There will always be one more thing. But, and this distraction, by the way, is the thing that I just heard today, talking about the corruption there, the political correctness here, and so on and so on. And while a generation is busy seriously explaining whether asylum is a human right, whether the EU is guilty for suffering after centuries of colonialism, whether we should stand by and watch people just die in the Mediterranean Sea, other people found parties, write books, take positions in the boards of important companies, or simply enjoy their life, which is, after all, our only one. Yet, every time I had to wait, it was also time for reflection. Every class that had to be repeated made you better. A generation that was told it had to be twice as good indeed is now twice as good. And this is what you're noticing right now. Your time is over. You have five minutes left. This I can see clearly now. Many thanks. This was Nekat Yaziri, um, amongst other dramaturg, theatre maker. But I, actually, I would invite you to read. I think you all got the bios of the different speakers. It's so beautiful, I'm not even going to try to um, <laughs> summarize what's in there. Our next speaker I would like to invite on the stand is uh, Karin Heun. Uh, she's assistant professor at the Department of Public Governance and Management at the University uh, of Utrecht. And she wrote her uh, PhD on discourse analysis of parliamentary debates on asylum policy. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, yes. Uh, there is I, a PowerPoint. Sorry. There yeah. Is there. There is a PowerPoint. PowerPoint. Do you have the clicker? 
Ja. 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 It works. Um, yes, I do think that uh, Europe, or as Paul Schaeffer said, we are partly responsible for issues we discuss today. Uh, the failing to address root causes, the striking of deals with dictatorships, and so on and so on. Uh, and today we have seen a lot of zooming out on this issue. We have seen a lot of uh, zooming out towards legal, ethical and political context of this issue. What we have seen today is that there is this balance, or perhaps this balance, um, a trade-off, sometimes uh, it's called like that, between, on the one hand, the protection, protection of national interests, and on the other hand, the protection of human rights of refugees. And that has been always the case. This balancing between national interests, economic interests, social, social cultural interests, security interests of states and of refugees. And it is very difficult to balance that. And everybody wants both these issues. However, states mostly focus on national interests, not only their own national interests, vis-à-vis uh, -vis, uh, refugees, but also the national interest between themselves, so within the European Union. And what we see is that that leads to a deadlock with many negative effects for refugees, on their security, on their autonomy, and also for society on, uh, for example, on integration problems. So many people agree, also in this room many people agree, we should try and strike a new balance between the national interests and the protection of national interests and the protection of human rights of refugees. And what states do is they keep on talking and talking and talking about these issues. And uh, I think we should step away from these repeating debates. We should step away from repeating over and over again how important it is to uh, defend our uh, economic interests, our security, and so on, and see that as a trade-off. And I think as long as the debate is done between states, we will always be in this repeating debate. So what a lot of people propose right now, with Benjamin Barber as the, the main uh, proponent uh, of this, is we should step away from the state's debate and get to uh, uh, the, the, the urban uh, level. So not states talking and talking all the time, but at the urban level doing things, trying to actually strike a new balance. Um, Sorry, um, I would want to give you one example of this, and that is called Plan Einstein in Utrecht. It's a former uh, office building which was transformed to living uh, places for asylum seekers, but also to f uh, living places for 40 youngsters from the neighborhood. And there are uh, courses, uh, English courses, all kinds of levels, entrepreneurship courses in English, because they are meant to be future free for asylum seekers, as well as for people from the neighborhood. So it's a project in which people live together, co-living, and learn together, co-learning. And it's future free. It's not uh, meant to prepare people only for integration in the Netherlands. It's meant to prepare people also for return or uh, um, uh, moving on. Um, so I think this is an important uh, new way of uh, having a debate on these issues. It's no longer states debating issues uh, amongst uh, themselves, talking and talking all the time, but cities actually doing things. It, I think this might strike a new balance between all the prioritizing of national interest 
and the protection of human rights of uh, refugees because the public opinion might be influenced when it sees that it actually can be done. It's not such a big deal. We have to do it, as Hermann Vosch uh, said. It's they are here, we have to protect uh, uh, refugees, and it can be done in a way that is better than the way it is done at this moment, if we actually start taking small steps. Thank you very so, much. Thank you. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Please do stay on. I would like to invite Robert Bohr. Um, to formulate uh, his question, he's an opinion maker and a columnist at Opinis, and also involved in the Netherlands uh, Leeuw. Okay. Um, the Central Bureau for Statistics, they published numbers on, uh, on uh, the mi non-Western migrants being more involved with crime and also making more use of uh, the welfare state benefits like uh, the bijstand, for example. And also this week a report was published by the Dutch Council on uh, uh, scientific, uh, uh, scientific Council for Government Policy, in which there was a negative correlation between diversity and uh, the, the social cohesion in areas, in, in urban areas. And also even between economic development and diversity in some areas in the Netherlands. So, uh, to come to my question, uh, your plea is to uh, have uh, cities being more involved with migrant policy and uh, the effects of non-Western migrants are, uh, are negative for the citizens of, of an urban area. My question to you is how would you propose to address those issues and uh, have uh, the economic impacts lessened, have the crime effect lessened, uh, the social cohesion effect? Could you elaborate on that? Yeah. Okay. Um, so thank you very much. I would like, so you got a, a question at the, at the micro level, let's say. I would like to invite uh, you to connect maybe uh, the ideas that you put forward with the fact that it's still very much the states to some extent that decide whether people actually get in and get out of the detention centers. Uh, but also the, the trend that we see today that it's almost criminalized to as citizens to give assistance to people when they're not regularized. So how would you integrate in your plan at the, at the city level to negotiate this with the, with the states that continue to, to have a lot of power? Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, I will first uh, address your uh, question. Yes, you're, you're absolutely right. We've seen the reports, the recent reports on, uh, on the problems with the integration of, uh, of migrants. And uh, there is uh, no point in uh, denying that at all. What I think is that with uh, this, this issue of protecting the national uh, interest, you, you can do that if you, and that is also what the reports are about, if you talk about regular migrants, people who come here voluntarily to a certain uh, extent, then it's very much uh, uh, very normal very acceptable, also in ethical terms, to say, what's in it for us? And if they don't meet up to the, to the standards, what's in it for us, then we can say, we have a big problem. Hey, we thought you would come and do something for it doesn't, uh, it doesn't happen. But with refugees, there is another issue. It's about protecting human rights of refugees. So it is not about what's in it for us, but it's what, what, is, what is the how can we protect their uh, human rights? How can we protect their physical security? How can we protect their autonomy or their, well, life beyond physical security? So it would be sort of weird to judge refugees on uh, are they good enough in uh, integration in Dutch society? That is not the issue. One could do that with regular migrants and that's very acceptable but not with refugees. On the other hand, refugees need to integrate after they have been uh, 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 given a refugee uh, status. And that is where uh, experiments like Plan Einstein uh, come in. That is what helps them to, to bridge the waiting uh, period, to better prepare for integration in Dutch society, also perhaps for uh, uh, return uh, migration or moving, uh, moving on uh, migration, 
and it might help influence public opinion because the neighborhood, Overvecht in the Netherlands, a deprived neighborhood, actually sees the assets of being able to uh, do courses uh, uh, there and have young people living uh, there instead of it feeling like a burden. So thank you very much for this interesting uh, uh, question, but I think it, it makes a difference to talk about regular migrants or uh, refugees. Um, in uh, your uh, uh, question, yes, I agree, and I also think that uh, uh, Thomas Spijkerboer uh, uh, warned uh, about this, this issue during his, uh, well, the, the preamble of his, uh, his uh, talk, when he said, well, it's not cities uh, that decide, and there might be a sort of a clash coming up, um, increasingly coming up with uh, uh, the national level, because it's still states. That, uh, that take the decisions on uh, uh, having uh, refugees accepted or not. And yes, that's true, but we also see that increasingly uh, there seems to be a sort of a divide coming up between cities who are actually uh, confronted with what happens on the ground, integration, all these uh, kinds of things, and the national level, the European level, which is sort of, it seems to be loose from these, uh, these issues. So these two stances seem to clash more and more. And we will see what, uh, what happens in the near future. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you, Karin. Then can I please invite Reem, Reem Fada, to, uh, to speak. Uh, Reem Fada is from Ramallah. Uh, she's an independent curator uh, in the international arts scene and has been involved in many international exhibitions, has seen the world and, and can uh, share uh, possibly first-hand experiences with us as well. Thank you. I just felt that Europe dumped again a weight on me as a Palestinian having already been dumped the problem of Israel itself. So now it's a double dump. Uh, and so it's, it's something that I feel the weight of all, this, all these issues coming just now uh, on me. And, uh, and I want to throw it back at all of you in a double way as much as possible, both from my perspective as a Palestinian, suffering the crimes of Europe that have led to the creation of Israel, that has led to the refugee problem of the Palestinian that has re remained to this day an issue that is unsolved. And we are seeing it duplicated again from the Middle East every single day. And now Europe is suffering these consequences for having not dealt with the problem um, and having created the problem. We talk about uh, one thing that is very important for me that I've come to contend with and especially in this idea of refugees or immigration or human rights, there is a process of dematerialization that is happening. You're no longer dealing with material bodies. You don't think of human beings as flesh and bones, as Sinan described, cutting the umbilical cord with his teeth. Bodies, human beings, abstraction, bureaucracies that abstract people like numbers that require them to identify their villages on paper. Where did the lives of these people go? Where did their bodies go? How do we start to decolonize our languages, of the language of human rights itself, and refuse these abstractions, refuse referencing people into numbers? How do we accept to keep on talking about people as numbers? I really want the answer. This is something that we really need to contend with. What does it mean, colonization, and how does it persist? It means accumulating wealth of nations like Europe to this day, building your buildings, building your streets on the backs, on the monies of Africa, the Middle East, to this day. You buy, European Union buys six point billion dollars of weaponry from Israel. Six point billion. Don't you think you should give a fraction of that money to a refugee? That's 
same refugee, that abled body, that had an education, he paid for it with his money. He paid for a car. He paid for a house. He owns money. And he was deprived of it for war. I know people who are very rich from Palestine suddenly became in refugee camps. They were wealthy people. They were worth hundreds of thousands. Their hometowns in Yaffa are worth millions next to Tel Aviv hotels. They're worth money. Reparations and debt is what Europe owes these refugees. It's about time that we repair that debt with actual money. Europe completely drained Africa and the Middle East, drained it from resources, drained it from abled bodies. Time is money. They drained it from time. This is the debt that Europe owes everyone around it. And this is the debt that they owe to give back to the refugees and everybody here. It's about time that we stop talking about freedom of mobility or wanting to show papers and get rid of that nonsense and allow the flow of capital and bodies to build something better for everyone. And that is how we start to humanize and rid ourselves of dehumanization. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would like now to uh, ask you to give us the last bits of your attention for our final speaker. Marton Gulias. Marton is a Hungarian political activist and a director. He is former manager of the uh, Krita Core Foundation and co-founder of the leftist political activist group Human Platform. Thank you. Um, but that was a wonderful speech. I'm really, I'm, well, I'm out of words, but I try to uh, rule up for the f task. Okay, so, uh, dear members of the jury, they're accused. It is not difficult to offer a direct answer to the question whether Europe is guilty or not in the deaths and the misery of those people who are right now languishing in so-called refugee camps on the Turkish soil or dying in the Mediterranean Sea, because the answer is evident, yes. Europe, its institutions, and both its elected and non-elected decision makers, simply we, are guilty. The real question is the following. How could we end in in, up in such a situation where most of us lament about this, rather than admit our ethical responsibility and think about practical steps to make things right? Europe has the resources to accept hundreds of thousands of asylum seekers without serious negative consequences. Even if Europe had accepted one million refugees per year since 2015, the total number of new residents will not even approach 0.5% of the entire population of the European Union. But right now, the majority of European politicians and the public appear to be fully convinced that our already existing challenges, such as in the distribution of wealth, housing crisis, and so on, would become more difficult to resolve if refugees in large number were accepted. I have a strong hope that here in this venue, I don't have to argue to prove that this is, as the ancient Romans called it originally, a bullshit. But even if we agree about this, the phenomenon of anti-refugee sentiment and fear among European citizens, citizens of the fortress Europe, still exist. Please the video. A brüsszeli bürokraták azt követelik, hogy Magyarország változtassa meg bevándorlás politikáját. Ez felháborító. Most egy Soros György pénzzel beszervezett Brüsszel támogatva pereket indít hazánk ellen. Várjunk ki Magyarországért, mert csak nekünk van jó úgy eldönteni, hogy kit engedjük be hazánkba. A kötelező betelepítési kóta növeli a terrorveszélyt. Minden 12. másodpercben újabb illegális bevándorló érkezik Európába. 
ellenőrizetlenül lépik át a határt, így nem tudjuk kik ők, és mennyi közöttük az álcázott terrorista. A bevándorlási válság kezdete óta vészesen megnőtt a terrortámadások száma Európában. Itt is megtörténhet. Ne kockáztassuk Magyarország jövőjét! The footage used in this short clip was not modified in any way. All were part of official campaign ads created by the Hungarian government between 2016 and 2018. Hungary is considered right now as a flagship in the EU of xenophobia and anti-refugee fear-mongering. That is just partially true. Our government's views are shared by almost every other government everywhere across the euro. Sebastian Kurz, Emmanuel Macron, leaders of Slovakia, Czech Republic and Poland are maybe expressing their views more politely with shrewder rhetoric. But their core political ideas about refugees are very similar to Viktor Orban's, which is refugees go home and die somewhere else. These politicians don't appreciate that refugees value the European Union more than its own citizens. They risk their life to reach its soil. Isn't this the kind of enthusiasm that nationalist leaders want to see from their people? Citizens who will die for their country? I think our leaders could learn from the enthusiasm and the dedication of the refugees. And that is what I am going to offer right now. In one more minute, please. Uh, I try to. <laughs> Thank you. The Hungarian government launched a settlement bond program for wealthy foreigners. If you buy Hungarian state bonds worth 300,000 euro and pay an agency an additional 60,000 euro for its intermediary services, you will get a permanent residency status and access to the EU. The government suspended this program in 2016, but there are serious rumors about relaunch. That is why I will launch an Indiegogo site where I will transfer the 500 euro I will get for my first participation on two panels. My goal is to raise 360,000 euro to buy permanent citizenship for one refugee. If my government doesn't listen to my wish to accept more asylum seekers, then I have to force them with the only authority they obey, money. But how to decide which person would be eligible to get this citizenship? Let's do it in a vulgar and banal way, because that's the what we love to do it all the time consuming and creating soap operas in order to commercialize every existential questions of ours that matters. So, let's do a contest. <laughs> the Eurovision Citizenship Contest. It will follow exactly the same format as the Eurovision Song Contest, a TV program which is supposed to address visions and identify questions about what it means to be a European, but which definitely fails to fulfill its original objectives. Our competition will be different. In this contest, every European nation will be represented by a refugee who would like to live on the soil of that particular nation, who would like to become a member of that nation. In this competition, if the competition is realized, the question of worthiness, the question of eligibility related to the European citizenship status will not be abstract anymore. The cruel reality of the fortress Europe will be on stage to confront us with ourselves. The responsibility to judge whether that particular asylum seeker is worthy or eligible for a citizenship will not be delegated to impersonal institutions far away from the citizens. It will be on our hands. Another conclusion, sorry. One sentence, please, if you can. In the past 12 years, 6 million euro arrived in Hungary daily from the European funds but the scope of beneficiaries were quite limited. Aside from German, French, and Austrian companies who got huge tenders, only a few Hungarian oligarchs and a tiny fraction of medium-sized enterprises profited from these funds. This resulted in a mainly overfunded and ineffective investment, which had no impact on the standard of living of Hungarian citizens. So my argument is, if you as a citizen never felt included in a society or supported by your state, 
by the EU in your daily struggles, then you are just not capable of accepting, let alone demanding, an inclusive policy towards refugees. The government of my country won the election back in April not with the promises of better living standards. They didn't pledge any increase in the wages or pensions. They didn't promise any better education or health care. They pledged only one thing. We can guarantee your life will not become more miserable as it is right now. In the mirror of this phenomenon, we have to face with the question, are those people xenophobic who are against the inclusion of migrants, refugees, or are they rather in such deprived circumstances that their minds and souls are occupied with the daily struggles, and from their perspective, anything related to change, inclusion, and so on, could be nothing else but danger. My point is that inclusion has some preconditions, and the EU doesn't fulfill them at all. The elite is against inclusion because they could not privatize it, as there is no business opportunity in it. Ordinary citizens are against inclusion because they are aware of the fact that there will be no more resources for redistribution. So it would mean that they have to have sol show solidarity towards refugees. But that is the thing which they also need, and no one shows them. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will hear now a question from our last respondent. Sid Lukasen is a researcher and author of books such as Democracy in its Media and The West and Identity. There is a duality between only two options. Either you're a xenophobe or you're inclusive. And if this is the only two flavors and yet such an approach, first of all, does not take into account the dissatisfaction of the indigenous people living in Europe, it also leads to a policy based upon ultimately yeah, randomness, arbitrariness, because even if we accept a million refugees, as you said, that's not even a percentage of the world poor, and there will be so many who are left behind, and there will be so many who are dissatisfied with this arrival, which ultimately brings me uh, to the question, which is this, what's your story to secular, well-integrated minorities that we have here in Europe, who have fled their life, trying to live a Western lifestyle here, based upon freedom, and yet they are confronted with the same repressive practices, growing subcultures and enclaves that they sought to escape from in the first place. And we already see that these groups are lining up with national conservatives. What's your story to them, as we can hardly call these people uh, saying they're xenophobic? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um... Before you get to the answer, one very last short question for me. So we, we heard today from several speakers many legal arguments, although we did agree that the topic is mainly a moral one. So that made me think of the words of Dr. Martin Luther King, who wrote that morality cannot be legislated, but behavior can be regulated. Judicial decrees may not change the heart, but they can constrain the heartless. And you are also known for your activist work, and I would like to, know, to ask you that from your experience so far, how do you see the role of the law in dealing with such issues and what other tools citizens have? Okay. First, I try to give a response on the gentleman's question. Uh, yes, I agree with you that uh, um, a measure where we try to destroy capitalism and try to you know, um, redistribute the wealth we have, not just in Europe, but in everywhere uh, in the rich world, uh, so without these kind of uh, uh, measurements, there will be no solution for this, uh, uh, for this poverty, which is the biggest drive behind uh, migration. So I, yes, I think uh, worldwide redistribution of wealth is necessary in order to create an equal and just world where migration uh, or, you know, uh, we, we, we will not even be confronted with such a questions. Uh, whether we should accept or not uh, people who are uh, trying to get asylum um, in our countries. But uh, regarding to your uh, other question, uh, I don't think that xenophobia, uh, xenophobia um, means that, uh, so I guess xenophobia means that you are pretending that the origin or the living circumstance or, or, or origin or the, or the birth circumstances of a single person does anything with that single person's activities and, 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 uh, and actions. 
And yes, if someone is accusing another person just because of the skin of their color or just because of their background with crimes which he or she didn't even commit, yes, that's xenophobia, no matter what you know, kind of uh, 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 race you belong to. And I guess it's very important to uh, talk about xenophobia in that uh, understanding that we should address the social circumstances, we should address that what kind of uh, social background that certain per person has. And you know, just give me my example, I was born and raised in Hungary, and after the transition back in the 90s, tens of thousands of uh, Chinese uh, migrants came into my country. For example, there was even, you could say, an enclave of Chinese in the capital of Hungary. And no one had any problem with them. So these kind of uh, cultural differences didn't occur to anyone, really. Um, so my, from my perspective, of course, I'm not living in Germany. I'm not living on those, in those countries uh, which are affected um, immigration or, or, or asylum seekers the most. But I could say from my perspective that this is a shame that such a country, which is still a rich country, uh, I'm talking about Hungary, so as a country, as Hungary, could not accept more refugees, tens of thousands of refugees, because we would have the resources for this. That was my main point in my presentation, that when my government denies the access from these people to get their asylum status, asylum seeking status, uh, uh, saying that it would you know, get sources rid of from those people who are Hungarian citizens and already in need. These are not, contra these are, these are not two things which are uh, against each other. We could solve uh, the lives of those people who are living in poverty in my country, but not against uh, the help which would provide to those people who are asking for help at the borders of our country. And relating Second to your question, question um, I'm not a law expert, so I have absolutely just a personal comment on this issue. During this week, my government uh, initiated a new legislation called Stop Soros, which will um, put a penalty on every NGO and every employee and every, and any NGO which are dealing with providing help to asylum seekers and refugees. So if you are providing information, you are providing food or any other help in order to that particular person be eligible for an asylum status and get the citizenship, you are committing a crime. You are committing a crime and you could easily be uh, detained or could arrested. Uh, and this is not a joke. It is not, you know, something over a uh, simplified version of the legislation. This is really written in the legislation. So, for example, such a project which I initiated in my presentation could, you know, um, cause me legal troubles in my country because I'm promoting here acceptance of refugees. Um, so I guess if, you know, those people who were elected, and of course they have the constitutional majority in their hand, using their power just to uh, initiate these kind of an horrific, un un unhuman laws, these are not acceptable ones. And I guess then you should read more about Toro, about Martin Luther King, about Gandhi, and civil disobedience is the only tool in such a situation which you could use to fight against these absolutely unacceptable laws. Thank you very much. very undemocratically the last round because a judge without a court is uh, if we're not left with any voters or any jury then the court will have to suspend itself and since we have run, run out of time uh, quite over time I will limit my remarks to basically again leaving you with a couple of questions and then finishing with the questions that you will really have to answer uh, at the end in our voting process that we will initiate in a few minutes. Just uh, the, the idea of the summing up that I wanted to give, the, uh, the questions are, uh, we've put out there that Europe is on trial. We've seen some strong statements from people who experienced what Europe, or we, have done to it firsthand. And we have seen more abstract discussions as to what uh, the more global picture, the picture of what, uh, what, where is Europe, what is Europe, what does it stand for, and what are its larger legal, moral, historic obligations. Um, 
What is on the scrutiny here? What is on trial? What is Europe? Is it the institutions in all of their variations? Is it the states that constitute it? Is it us, the citizens? I think we have called at the beginning that us being here, the citizens, will have to represent all of it here and think about it. But mainly, and this has come back many times from the witnesses in particular, what about the non-citizens, the would-be citizens, the newcomers, the undocumented, the invisible, those we don't see or don't want to see, the stateless and the homeless, are they part of Europe? The question we'll have to answer that has been put out here is, is Europe under threat? And if so, from whom? How bad is it? <coughs> If Europe, and therefore also us present here, is under threat, what measures do we have to take to defend it? And in doing so, does Europe, again, us here, commit wrongdoings, violate our own principles, our own very principles upon which we meant to build Europe? I was, as I said, I was struck by the, 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 the personal statements. I was struck by the concept of, of debt that Europe has created. Uh, the, the, the reflection that Reim gave us about us, Europe, getting back something that we have created and having to deal with it. Um, listening to everyone here, I thought uh, we could walk away here as well, uh, make it simple, with the conclusion it's complicated, which is because we heard so many viewpoints and also overlapping viewpoints, also where actually people agree that what you would think are from, come from different camps so to say. Um, simplification is welcome, in a sense, and we will have to try to simplify it with the five questions that will remain. Um, we're here now to make decisions, we, the people of Europe. Most likely difficult decisions, decisions about the Europe that we live in, the Europe we want to live in, and what is this Europe should look like. <laughs> These decisions are also decisions about yourself, as has been said many times by now. So beware what you wish for. The proven chosen here today is quite harsh, guilty or not guilty. I was going to put out, uh, and I think I need a PowerPoint there, the preamble, but I'll just put it out there for you to read if you have a moment. Preamble of the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union. I think it says it all, what we're all meant to be and meant to represent. I will not read it out here, but I think we'll want to give you a minute to look at it yourself. Uh, having said that, and giving you a minute to look at that, uh, I will go back to the table, <coughs> we'll formulate the questions, and ask your answers to it. Note the preservation of common values respecting diversity in cultures and traditions of the peoples of Europe, national identities of the member states. And we need to strengthen the protection of fundamental rights in the light of changes in society. We're here for the first question. What we'd like to do is, if you agree that on this particular question, Europe is guilty of human rights violations of migrants by upholding an impenetrable Fortis Europe, if you say guilty, would invite you to stand up. If you stand up, it's guilty. If you sit, it's not guilty. There is no way in between in this forum. So me sitting down meaning, means not guilty. Sorry. That's not us, sir. <laughs> not the panel. No, the panel, the panel is the only one that's exempted. Okay. So may I invite the remaining jury to say guilty or not guilty? I don't think a count is Ahmad. It will only be a guilty or not guilty. We will not pronounce the numbers, but I think the numbers are obvious. Second question which has been something we've seen from Reim's presentation, but also Hermann Feischer mentioned it, Paul did. Guilty, is Europe guilty of colonial amnesia? I think you can imagine what we mean by that. Is it violating its historical and moral obligation 
to redistribute its acquired wealth. Please stand up if you think Europe is guilty of that. I think we can see where a majority goes. Those standing and walking, is it guilty or not guilty? <laughs> <laughs> Good, please sit down, thank you. Is Europe guilty of not adequately protecting its own citizens from the terrorist threats infiltrating the migration movement and not protecting the European culture and religious identity? That is the flip side of the coin that we've uh, tried also to get into the discussion. Is the question clear? Is Europe guilty of not protecting its own citizens of the terrorist threat and also not protecting its cultural and religious identity? If you think Europe is guilty of that, Europe, us, you, then please stand up. Three persons standing up. Four persons standing up. Thank you. Next question. Is Europe guilty of failing to show solidarity with countries that take in a much higher number of refugees? And then we don't, uh, that can relate to European member states, but also states outside the European Union. I see a hand, which means Ahmed is also standing up. Thank you. And then let's finally really turn ourselves and say, are we European citizens guilty of neglect? And what do we mean by neglect? Are we guilty of not actively defending the rights of migrants within our own communities and societies? It's a tricky one. Please let know what you think. I see people sitting, I see people standing. I hope Lara will be able to reflect upon that in her final words. Last question. No, that was the last question. We had many more for you, but for time's sake. Thank you very much. I think the line of reasoning is clear. We, uh, can, can the PowerPoint come back because we have an epilogue? After. Yes. Lara Stahl. Dear audience, people present, um, I feel bad about taking more of your time. I realize this has been a very long session. Maybe putting Europe on trial is impossible. I mean, we knew it was impossible in three hours. Um, so maybe it was bound to get too long. Um, as this is a uh, a people's tribunal, I feel I have to check with you. I prepared something, it will be 10 minutes. Shall I try to shorten it? I shorten? So, sh shall we say, I shorten, please stand up? <laughs> <laughs> or do I do the full thing, 10 minutes? This tribunal is not very clear. I think you're welcome right. to do 10 minutes. That's okay, what here we go. Maybe halfway, if you do like this, I, I know I have to speed up. <laughs> In a criminal case, the verdict, guilty or not guilty, is handed down by the jury. A verdict of guilty in a criminal case is generally followed by a judgment followed by a sentencing. One, verdict. The term verdict comes from the Latin word veredictum, which literally means to say the truth. Well, members of the jury, you've just spoken. Your verdict is clear. You have taken position and expressed your truth. There's something fascinating about truth. There's something fascinating about the way we organize truth procedures. Although the court makes use of people, sorry, performativity, roles, rituals, rhetorics, and even costumes. We as associate the judicial process with truth and that of art or theater with fiction. And while there were no actors in this trial today and were standing in the historical court building of Amsterdam, 
we might see this event as artistic, or in other words, not real. A couple of days ago, Yunus and I were discussing an interview he was about to have with a journalist of One World about this project. And one of the questions she wanted to ask him was, why theater? And Yunus said to me, why not? Isn't the whole world theater? So what constitutes the truth? When is something true and when is it subjective? And who decides? Even in a court, we cannot erase subjectivities because courts are made by people and people are not objective. Subjectivity is present in every element of truth seeking, social values, political dynamics, personal taste, choice of words, timing. All, the, all these elements are influencing the outcome of a case. Truth is not the same everywhere or in every time. And for me, this doesn't dismiss the validity or, an, or necessity of truth seeking procedures. On the contrary, it emphasizes the immense responsibility we have. What we decide is true is intrinsically political. It is rooted in the values we hold dear. But today, our world seems to be more and more ruled by technocracy. Therefore, this is a deliberately ideological trial to speak about the underlying values under our decisions. And during these three hours, almost four, three and a half, Europe on Trial has tried to be an open space to exercise our morality, a place where we develop ethical discourse, where we question ourselves and try to look at the darkest side of what it means to live in the world today. And despite this court having no legal power, I am convinced that what is said does matter. We are shaped by how we speak and listen. Words aren't passive. They become the lenses we look through and base our actions on. We never operate isolated from the world outside, and we will bring what was said here into other networks and other exchanges. These mutations are unpredictable, and it's impossible to measure their impact, but let's not think there isn't any. We may think that official institutions are real and that a project like this is not, but reality is an outcome of a permanent negotiation between ideas that are not real yet and actions. And democracy is nothing more than a constant dialogue between the here and now and the possible. Today, we've showed that it's possible to say that Europe is guilty. And for me, the world looks different after such a verdict. Two, judgment. In court, the judgment is the moment the judge explains the reasons for the verdict. But as this is a people's tribunal where everybody has spoken, this wouldn't make any sense. You alone know the reasons that have been informing your judgment. Essentially, you've been judging yourself. Still, there's something I'd like to say about this. This is a people's tribunal, but nobody pretends that we are re representing an accurate reflection of society. There are very few places, unfortunately, in the world that are for everyone. Still, we try to break through our own bubble and reach out to other people, and we found a group of people who do not share the same viewpoints, but were willing to trust us, and we were willing to trust them. And because of this, not everyone voted the same. Democracy is a simultaneous acknowledgement of the rights of majorities and minorities, and we need this plurality in order to have a choice. When choice is taken away from us, as is happening in the European political systems of today, extremist voices might take over. So let's try to be each other's respectful enemies. Three, sentence. A sentence is a degree of punishment. It can involve a degree of imprisonment, a fine, or other punishments against a defendant convicted of a crime. Today, we've put Europe on trial. As Europe consists of many layers, peoples, and structures, we've decided that we, citizens of the European Union, were the closest representatives to fulfill this role. And so, we've put ourselves to trial. What does self-punishment look like? A majority of the jury in this court have found Europe guilty. No one else but us can continue to remind ourselves of what has been said and decided here today. Guilt is often associated with something passive, punishment with something that is imposed. But we, Eunice and I, believe guilt might be a chance. A chance to take responsibility for our actions and act upon what we hold to be true and just. There's one last thing I want to say. Do I see hands up for, please stop. 
Four minutes. Here we go. Last Monday, a refugee camp in Paris was cleared because of general welfare and security reasons, according to the French government. Minister Gérard Colomb said that police services will be fully committed to preventing such camps being built again. It was the 34th evacuation that took place in Paris, and Macron is trying to push for a new immigration law that would speed up the asylum process and lead to increased detentions and deportations. Last Wednesday, Mamoudou Gassama saved a four-year-old boy who was hanging from a balcony in the 18th arrondissement of Paris. People filmed the scene and it went viral. Macron immediately reacted by saying that this heroic act would be recognized and Mr. Gassama would get his papers as soon as possible. The French president added that he had invited Mr. Gassama to apply, to apply for French citizenship because France is built on desire and Mr. Gassama's commitment clearly showed that he has that desire. These two actions, clearing a refugee camp on Monday and granting Mr. Gassamas his papers on Wednesday, reveal a very painful reality. It shows we're only capable of seeing refugees as people when someone is capable of hauling themselves hand over hand from one balcony to another, springing from one floor to another to save a child. Only when someone enters the realm of the hero does that person get humanized and granted a place in our society. Next Monday, around 60 people from We Are Here have to leave a neighborhood in Amsterdam called the Rudolf Dieselstraat, where they've squatted 22 small houses since late April. The group has lived in more than 40 squats over the last six years. And when we spoke to a neighbor, they stated that nobody in the Rudolf Dieselstraat had a problem with their pre presence. Aymere, however, the housing company that owns the houses, won't start demolition until September the 6th. Even so, they have to leave this coming Monday. I've had the opportunity through this project and previous project to meet and work with some people of We Are Here and the Night Shelter. And I'm amazed how brave and strong they are and continue to fight for their rights. And I'm also deeply ashamed by how people who have already suffered so much are treated here. We are breaking people once they arrive and we're surprised if they become violent or too sick to work and participate in our society. Today, we've declared with a majority that Europe is guilty of violating human rights with our asylum policies. Let's imagine we're all drops in the ocean. Let's imagine it's never too, too late to change direction. Let's transform our guilt into responsibility. And let's act upon it. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, to everyone um, for sharing this time. I like <laughs> to remind time here. Um, and there's no any additional words to, to add to this. So I just wanted to thank you for your presence and uh, have a, a, a great rest of the evening and the day. Thank you. One last announcement by Eunice about the follow-up. Um, yeah. And in December, we will do Netherlands on trial. Um, Amsterdam, on trial. Amsterdam on trial. And then? And then the Netherlands on trial later. Later. So um, it's a continuous process. And thank you all for being here.